Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. For those in virtual attendance, please note that there is a globe icon near the hand feature on your screen. This will allow you to listen to tonight's meeting in Spanish. Our interpreters this evening are Maya Fonseca and Gilberto Martin del Campo. Thank you very much for your time and services today. Muy buenas, no Muy buenas noches a todos. Les pedimos una disculpa por el retraso. Necesitábamos esperar eh, para tener el suficiente coro, pero ahora vamos a iniciar. Yo soy eh, la alcaldesa Jen Wallacing y bienvenidos eh, a la reunión del Consejo Regular y Especial de la Ciudad del 27 de junio. Esta es una reunión híbrida con el Consejo de la Ciudad, el personal de la ciudad y miembros del público en la Cámara del Consejo de la Ciudad. Para quienes nos acompañan de manera virtual, por favor, eh, Sépanse de que hay eh, un globito eh, terráqueo eh, en su eh, pantalla. Esto va a permitir a que ustedes al oprimir eh, ese globito eh, terráqueo eh, puedan escuchar esta reunión en español. Nuestros intérpretes esta noche son la señorita Maya Fonseca y el joven Gilberto Martín del Campo. Muchísimas gracias por su tiempo y por sus servicios el día de hoy. Gracias. Um, please note that public comment speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers we have for each item. We'll begin this evening with our roll call. I would like to introduce city council members and staff present. Next to me, we have council members Maria Dorr and Betsy Nash. Please note that Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor and city council member Drew Combs are absent this evening. Staff present include our city manager, Justin Murphy, Assistant City Manager Stephen Stolte, and our Acting City Attorney Mary Wagner. We also, of course, have our City Clerk Judy Heron. And Ms. Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. And again, echoing a welcome to our June 27th special and regular meeting for members of the public who wish to provide comment on any of tonight's agenda items. After the mayor calls for public comment on that item, if you're participating virtually, we'll ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine. If participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And that does include my instructions at this time. Mayor Willison, please continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Um, so we have our first agenda item, which is our closed session item C. And City Clerk Heron, will you please call for public comment on agenda item C, one. Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on closed session item C, one conference with labor negotiators, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on closed session item C1. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willis, we may continue. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, the city council will adjourn to closed session and will report out immediately following the closed session. We are anticipating reconvening this meeting. Um, excuse me, city manager Murphy, do you still anticipate us coming back at six? At six o'clock. Thank you very much.
Okay, I'm having a, a quorum back at our in-person days. Mara Willison, you may re-follow the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, so the um, we had started in this chambers and then we went to closed session and now we are back. And for those of you just joining us, I am Mayor Jen Wallison and I'm reconvening the City Council's June 27th special and regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. Please note that public speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers we have for each item. I would first like to introduce once again our city council members and staff present. Uh, Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor and Council Member Drew Combs are absent this evening, but with me tonight on the dais, I have Council Member Maria Dorr and Council Member Betsy Nash. Sitting at the staff table, we have our city manager Justin Murphy, Assistant City Manager Stephen Stolte, and our Acting City Attorney Mary Wagner. And of course, we are joined by our fabulous City Clerk Judy Heron. So we're going to begin by reporting out from the closed session that we just left, and I'm happy to report that an agreement was reached with SEIU for a successor labor agreement, and the early release staff report has been made available. Um, it was made available yesterday, Monday, June 26, in advance of the July 11th City Council meeting um, to discuss that item. We are now moving on to item F or section F, agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. So at this time, do either of my colleagues on the dais have any council items they wish to pull or um, move around? Council member Dorr. Thank you. I would like to pull um, in the consent calendar one of the items. Please. Oh, what item is that? I'm looking for the number. Apologies. H1. Oh, H1. sorry, C C1, special business. Uh, can you read what the, are, is this one of the minutes? It's on the minutes, yes. Okay, so uh, we will pull H1 and look at the minutes when the time comes. Um, Thank you. To discuss. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Okay, we are moving on then to G, which is public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment, other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment at the appropriate times for members of the public to address the city council on items that are already on the agenda. Those sections include the consent calendar, public hearing, regular business, and informational items. So at this time, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment for an item not on tonight's agenda, if participating virtually, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. So Mayor Wilson, I have a total of five comments at this time. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Let's go ahead with our three minutes, please. Great. All right, and so our first speaker will be John McKenna, and then followed by Katie Roof. Uh, Honorable Mayor, City Council members, City staff, and the entire Menlo Park community, you will hear from many youth voices this evening. Please honor their words. We hold their future in our hands. The decisions we make 
and the actions we take today will determine their future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Katie Roof, followed by Emily Mischer. Good evening, council members. My name is Katie Roof, um, and you might remember me from last week. Um, I'm a recent Gunn High School grad, and now I'm a current intern with Menlo Spark and a close liaison with groups like ASAP Actera and 350 SV Palo Alto. I'm going to let the youth speak for themselves, but before that, I wanted to explain why we're here in person, online, stuck in traffic, but supposed to be here, and in your inbox today of all days. Originally, today was supposed to be a key study session to discuss an update to building codes for existing buildings emissions. This study session has been already uh, repeatedly delayed. Now, even there isn't any significant climate topics on your agenda tonight. We are here, therefore, to hold you accountable and to demand that action is taken when it is promised, rather than delayed seemingly indefinitely almost, because we understand that time is limited. But you know that time is limited too. I know you know that climate change is an ur urgent issue and you're told that repeatedly. The thing is, I also know that you are understaffed and thanklessly overworked. I believe therefore that we need to change the way that we think about change making. We must realize that it will take the effort of a community of empowered youth and engaged citizens to help you shift to more sustainable track. I believe therefore that to begin this redirection process, I propose a Menlo Park Youth Climate Team. As the first gathering of this youth climate team, again, you can't see all of us, we're a little bit virtual. We are all here today to remind you why you are in this fight and how capable your community members are of stepping up and supporting you. I must acknowledge that I know your sustainability journey is a marathon, not a sprint. Why continue wait when you can't even see the finish line yet? Well, if, it's not, if we are not enough of a reminder, I urge you to zoom out and think about your actions as a symbol of the progress that our nation can be making overall. I know that you have already had an impact on the way our nation is operating in terms of sustainability. And I hope that you'll realize that change is possible and quickly magnified, but it is also extremely tedious, frustrating, and often almost inconspicuous. I'm determined though, to empower youth to seize their opportunity to contribute to the change that you are driving that we can drive with even stronger force together. I'm determined that by creating this Menlo Park Youth Climate Team with support from Actera's ASAP program and 350 SV Menlo Park's team, that this certainly will not be the last time that you hear the voices of your youth. Through this climate team, I look forward to collaborating with you all to build the change your youth need to see. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Emmaville. Mishra, um, apologies if <laughs> my handwriting's not great. And then um, followed by Alex Wagenfeld. Hello, council members, mayor and staff. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to speak tonight. My name is Anjali. Um, Menlo Park has been a leader in decarbonization from enhancing the REACH code last year to require more EV charging to passing a REACH code in 2019 that requires all new construction to be electric. Beyond these policy reforms, the city has also set the goal of reaching net zero by 2030 as outlined in your climate action plan. I applaud all these efforts by the city, but I'm concerned that it is not at the scale nor speed necessary to reach its goals. As a young person, I'm incredibly concerned about the impacts of climate change. And I know myself and my fellow young people will be the ones to actually live with the future consequences from the policy and action of today. Youth, developing countries, low-income communities have done the least to cause the problem of climate change, but will and are experiencing the worst effects. To solve the global problem of climate change, it will require those in places of privilege to step up and contribute their resources. Menlo Park is in a place both politically and financially prepared to support stronger electrification initiatives, which will not only help the city reach its own goals, but will also set precedent for the rest of the Bay Area. For example, after passing the all electric new construction code, 15 other cities in California followed. Menlo Park is clearly a powerful influence. I strongly encourage that the council one, focus their efforts on electrifying existing buildings, which together with transportation are 90% of all total emissions. And two, to expand the EV charging for multifamily properties. 
Educating the public on the health and environmental benefits of shifting from gas to electric is also an impactful tool for encouraging folks to electrify their homes. There's also existing infrastructure that you can leverage. You can apply for grant funding from the Infrastructure and Investment Act, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. In your 2019 call to action, you said the urgency and magnitude of the challenge of addressing climate change calls for leaderships in all sectors of society, all institutions, and all elected leaders, including at the local city and neighborhood level. Act on these words and be a leader not only for Menlo Park, but the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Alex Wagenfeld, followed by Will Simon. Hello, council, council members, mayor, and staff. Thank you for letting me speak here today. Um, my name is Alex Wagenfeld. I'm 17. I live in San Mateo County. I'm here to plead to help the billions in our world to have a place to live in 27 years. I'm commenting, commenting today about climate change. But firstly, I want to thank the city for working to de decarbonize city buildings and vehicles, enhancing the 2022 reach code to require more EV charging, and signing the 2019 resolution declaring a climate emergency. I were here asking for Menlo Park to continue to act responsible, like we have shown we can do in the past, and follow through with the goals and timeline that we have set in the Climate Action Plan. And I say continue because work has been done and policies have been passed, but we need to continue through with them. If this was 30 years ago, maybe we would have more time and it wouldn't be as pressing to decarbonize this fast, but we're on a ticking time bomb and this is more urgent than ever. So here are the two scenarios to deal with the looming disaster of climate change. One, we can't find a way to get our act together. We end up moving too slowly. We don't pass policy fast enough meaning other counties around us and throughout the world don't pass policies fast enough as well. We miss our 2050 decarbonization mark and it triggers a sequence of detrimental cascading events to our planet. I don't like that one. Or two, we put actions behind our words and create a sustainable planet. We pass progressive climate policy like what is being discussed this evening or to continue with it, which not only helps Menlo Park, but also inspires other counties to be like us and save our planet. I like that one. We are the leaders, and for the past 50 years, the world has desperately needed climate leaders to take the uncomfortable first step so that others are able to take the more comfortable step after us. We are building momentum here, and we can bring the dream of a future to life. So I ask you, what are we waiting for? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Will Simon, followed by Nikki Donovan. Hello, Menlo Park City Council. My name is Will Simon and I'm a resident of Palo Alto. I'm here today uh, with environmental groups in the area um, to add to, well, first of all, to thank you for all the work you've done so far to address the climate crisis, uh, including working to pass a zero emissions landscape equipment ordinance this year, um, working to decarbonize city buildings and vehicles, eliminating permitting fees for electrification for, uh, projects, and numerous other resolutions, action plans, and city code updates that you've been working on in the past few years. Um, but I'm coming before you today to ask that um, this work be accelerated even more given the severity of the crisis and the urgency of it, which I have a unique vantage point in sort of seeing in a lot of the work I've done for the past few years as an international development professional. Um, I worked for about half a year in a peace building nonprofit um, involved in a lot of countries in Eastern Africa, including um, Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, and others. And for the past two and a half years, I've been working as a monitoring, evaluation, and research specialist, um, evaluating programs carried out in countries including Iraq, Syria, and Libya. The thing is, 
we don't see the worst effects of climate change here in the Bay Area or in the United States. As some of the other speakers have said today, the people bearing the very worst brunt of it are many of the people who already are most vulnerable and most disadvantaged. Just to mention a few examples. First of all, I've done a lot of work monitoring projects in Iraq. And this is a country that historically has been known as the land of the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. But today, due both to climate change and to dams that have been built on these rivers, the water flow is lower than it's ever been. Summer temperature highs in Iraq are now up, are on average now 112 degrees Fahrenheit each day and dust storms plague the country. While um, uh, Iraq is like the low water level of the rivers is causing the fresh water and soil in the country to become, uh, to like increase in salt content at an increasingly high rate, which is causing a loss of about 250 square kilometers of land per year due to desertification and soil salinization, according to the UN Environmental Program. Thank you. And this, oh, time's up. Oh, okay. If you can wrap it up, thank you. Okay. Um, basically, um, other countries are bearing extremely severe uh, burdens of climate change, and we have responsibility to act here to change that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up will be Nikki Donovan, followed by Crystal Hernandez. Hi, City Council. First off, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak, even though it's virtual. Um, my name is Nikki Donovan, and I'm a Bay Area resident in San Mateo County. First off, I'd like to say that I'm so incredibly thankful for all that you've done so far to help stop the climate crisis. However, there's still so far to go and so little time. On behalf of myself and Bay Area youth, I express strong support for effective climate action that would get Menlo Park back on track to meet its 2030 net zero goal. Specifically, I urge you to vote in favor of increasing the number of safe bike lanes, implementing energy efficiency in buildings, and encouraging zero emission landscaping. Focusing on bike lanes, I know many high schoolers, including myself, who have no choice but to commute to school by bike. However, especially during congested times of traffic, like when traveling to school, biking can be more dangerous than it should be. By adding more bike lanes, Menlo Park can not only keep its kids safe, but be the leader it strives to be in reducing its emissions. Every bike lane helps to encourage more bike riding, which in turn, which in turn decreases the number of cars on the road. So please vote in favor of funding the Middle Avenue bike lane, supporting energy efficiency, and encouraging net zero emission landscaping. All of these actions would help Menlo Park achieve its 2030 goals of sustainability, fairness, justice, and health. We need each and every city to have integrity in their promises and goals to ensure future generations can live in a habitable world. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Crystal Hernandez, followed by Chloe Chang. And this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Hello everyone, my name is Crystal Hernandez and I'm speaking on behalf of Octera. And I wholeheartedly support the comments made by John McKenna, Katie Roof, Angela Mishra, and Alex Wangenfield, to name a few, um, who were specifically commenting on the Climate Action Plan. Thank you so much, first of all, for holding this session tonight. I want to urge the Council to implement that Climate Action Plan as was our original goal. I'm a mom and an environmental professional. I think every day about the future of my children and what it will look like when we transition to a more sustainable future because the latter is too frightening to fathom. 
We have an urgency in the climate crisis, which was in our face 2020 during the wildfires that coated our bay in orange clouds. But unless you are a person struggling on the margins by the bay from an under-resourced community of color or um, of one of those um, third world countries as was um, spoken to earlier, um, it might not seem as immediate. We've already made so much progress here in Menlo Park via policy reforms, and we need more progressive action. Take the lead for the Bay Area, and more importantly, for our health, environment, and the future of our kids. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our final speaker is Chloe Chang. Good evening, council members. My name is Chloe Chiang, and I'm a Bay Area resident and a rising ninth grader at Castilea School. On behalf of my community, I urge that the Climate Action Plan moves forward so that we will reach our ambitious, prudent goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2030. In the past year, I have taken time to learn about what led us to this point. My peers and myself all have future aspirations, yet only a small fraction of them care to spread awareness to others or know what it means to use a reusable water bottle. I am grateful to have this platform today in the hope that all my peers and all others for the future will have an earth suitable for life. As crude as this sounds, the fact that a little less than 50 years into the, into the future means the bay rises three feet is horrifying and nothing of a flowering message. Menlo Park has more than the financial means to ensure conditions do not reach a point too detrimental for all, including lower income neighborhoods. Bellhaven, for example, would face the brunt of a lack of action in the not too distant future due to its location right along the bay. The first Earth Day movement was in 1970, and 100 years later, we would celebrate the centennial anniversary in the utmost ironic, depressing, and disappointing way with the flooding of the bay. Now, I am so glad that Menlo Park is ahead of this, but any form of a head start should be the standard in order to fight a crisis that has an inevitable, undetermined due date we have led into for quite some time. Other studies share that as early as 2027, we will meet the point of no chance, and the UN estimated that from now to 2052, we can meet that threshold where we cannot turn back. There is still so much uncertainty, but the effects already evident today show us that we do not need more motion, facts, or figures to tell us whether to sit around or not. We just need to know that we need to start now so Mellow Park can do its part. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no further hands or cards, Wellison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and I want to thank all of the public commenters this evening for so eloquently um, speaking before us. Um, much appreciated. Um, with that, we are moving on to the consent calendar, um, section H. Under the consent calendar, the City Council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion unless a City Council member city staff member or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our consent calendar items, H1, City Council meeting minutes, H2, an agreement for the maintenance and reporting of the Bedwood, Bedwell Bayfront Park landfill, H3, an amendment to a contract for the Middle Avenue Bicycle Lane Pilot. H4, an agreement for the HVAC systems at city buildings. H5, the adoption of an ordinance regard, uh, related to administrative citations. Or H6, a resolution updating a city council policy for commissions and committees. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items, H1 through H6. 
Seeing no hands or cards. Now, Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. So um, we did have a request from City Council Member Dorr um, regarding H1. So um, City Council Member Dorr, please. Thank you. I'm referring to our conversation, our joint meeting with the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. Uh, when we met with them, we talked about community preparedness opportunities. And in the notes here, it just mentions that we discussed scheduling another joint meeting to discuss an after action report from the storms. Uh, we also discussed maybe having a joint meeting with the other two cities that are involved in the, the joint district, um, including the um, including Atherton and East Palo Alto. And so just wanna have that reflected in the, the notes here that that is one of the items that was suggested. Thank you. Yeah, seeing support that is something I can add. Thank you. Thank you. So with that um, modification, um, is there a motion that someone would like to make? I'd like to make a motion. Wonderful. I will second. Thank you. Okay, so I will ask our city council to switch their screens to the vote cast system. Uh, we are seeing black screens. Oh, good. So for the members of the public, we are going to test out oh, a system called VoteCast, which allows us to do some fancy things here. Uh, so what do we do here? So okay. <laughs> Let's run that again. Thank you all for bearing with us as we figure out the new and I guess it's not new, nah. the technology. And you're still just seeing a black screen. We're seeing what is on, being projected. After hitting the fuzzy button? Uh, <laughs> we're re-pushing the fuzzy button okay. and now we are seeing black again. Okay, by roll call vote. <laughs> uh, City Council Member Dower. Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Uh, Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. And that's working. <laughs> that looks nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are now moving on to our public hearing, section I. Public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. Tonight's public hearing is I-1, adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram area of assessment, and ordering the levy and collection of assessments for landscaping assessment district for fiscal year 2023-24. Introduce, and to introduce this item is our management analyst two, Ms. Joanna Chen. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Wilson and members of the council. I'm Joanna Chen, the management analyst for Public Works. Now we'll move this closer. Nope. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now I'd like to begin off, uh, begin this presentation with some background information on how the landscape assessment district was created. Um, so in 1982, the voters approved a Measure N to form the Landscaping Assessment District. In 1983, the city established the district to provide proper street tree maintenance. In 1990, the city added an assessment for the repair and maintenance of sidewalks, gutter, uh, sidewalk curb, gutter, parking strips. And later on in 1980, 1998, voters approved a ballot measure to increase the district fees. Next slide, please. And so the district partially funds three city provided services, and those services are city street tree maintenance, street sweeping services, sidewalk curb, gutter, parking strip, uh, repair and replacement for areas damaged by city, city street trees. Next slide, please. And so, okay. 
And so for, for the tree maintenance program, it consists of uh, several city staff and one contractor, West Coast Arborist. And that contractor helps uh, conducts a routine maintenance every five years. Um, the tree division does the inspections, trimming, planting, and remo removal requests. So uh, residents can submit city tree related requests through Act Menlo Park. Um, the link is provided on the slide. Um, residents can submit requests outside of that five year uh, cycle. Uh, the program is funded by the district and by the general fund. Next slide, please. Yeah. The second city provided service is the street sweeping. Um, it is operated by city staff and a contractor. The contractor helps remove litter and debris from the streets, reduce the amount of debris flowing to the bay, and it minimizes the flooding during heavy rains. And so this program is funded by Measure M and the district. Next slide, please. Um, so the last city provided service includes replacing and repairing damaged sidewalks, curb, gutter, and parking strips that is damaged by city tree roots. Um, city staff and two contractors help maintain this program. Um, and for the repairs, they use the contractor uses a horizontal saw to shave down um, the sidewalk to minimize the tripping hazards. Uh, for the replacement program, um, it, the scope of work varies depending on how much it is, how much the um, public right of way is damaged by those roots. And so this program is funded by the capital improvement program as well as the district. Next slide, please. Um, so the district fees varies depending on several factors, such as the type of dwelling, the number of trees, and the type of uh, public improvement. Um, so these two tables are pulled from the engineer's report. Next slide, please. And for the fiscal year of 2023-24 proposal, uh, the tree assessment is increased uh, would increase by 3% to approximately $92, and the sidewalk uh, assessment would increase 3% to approximately $49. Um, so in other words, the net increase for the single family equivalent would be about $4. Um, and so the increase would account for tree care, uh, the tree pruning and street sweeping agreement costs, and as well as um, covering the annual sidewalk replacement needs and the current backlog. Uh, so the item before the council tonight is an annual action to continue the collection of these assessments. And that wraps up my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chen. So as this is a public hearing, there is a prescribed order in how we do things. Um, so I'll first ask my colleagues if there are any clarifying questions um, of Ms. Chen. Okay, um, because there are not, I would now like to open the public hearing. Um, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our public hearing item, I, one, adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram and area of assessment, and ordering the levy and collection of assessments for Landscaping Assessment District for fiscal year 2023-24, Participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on our public hearing item I-1. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, so I will now close the public hearing and open the item up for City Council discussion. So is there any City Council discussion on this item? Um, do we want to attempt to use the vote cast again, Ms. Heron, or shall we stick with roll call? Let's do another roll call while okay, I work Okay, fair on enough. That. Um, so is there Thank a motion you. and a second? Um, so I would be happy to move. Thank you. Uh, I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. 
just for my Mayor own Wilson, just for clarification, um, you're moving approval of the staff recommendation, correct? Thank you. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash, a second by Mayor Willison to adopt a resolution overruling protests, ordering the improvements, confirming the diagram area of assessment, and ordering the levy and collection of assessments. Any further City Council questions or discussions? Actually, um, before we vote, I just wanted to seeing the picture of the tree maintenance staff on the slide. I just wanted to once again extend um, the council's appreciation for all of the work, particularly during the storms um, that they did and um, year round, really. I, I get nothing but really fabulous comments about how responsive the staff is. So thank you, Ms. Chen, and um, just wanted to call that out particularly. Thank you. Thank you. Any further uh, city council questions or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Dower. Yes. City council member Nash. Yes. Mayor Willison. Yes. And the motion passes with uh, city council member Combs and vice mayor Taylor absent. All right, we are moving on to J, regular business. Under regular business, the city council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. The first regular business item is J1, adopt resolutions for fiscal year 2023-24, adopting budget and capital improvement plan, establishing appropriations limit, amending the salary schedule effective July 2nd, 2023, extending rate assistance program through June 2024, and accept award authority and bid requirement through June 2024. And to introduce this item is our administrative services manager, Brittany Mello. Ms. Mello, please. Thank you so much. I'll just share the screen. Seeing that all right. Okay. okay, good evening, Mayor and City Council. We're so pleased to share the proposed fiscal year 23-24 budget for adoption. I'm Brittany Mello, the Administrative Services Director, and we have here Marvin Davis, our Interim Finance Director. We also have our terrific finance budget team present today to help with any questions, as well as our executive team if you'd like to dive in to any particular item. So on tonight's agenda, we'll review the city council priorities that fed into the development of the budget. We'll review a summary of the changes to the budget that have been made since the June 13th public hearing. We'll review how that those changes have impacted the five-year general fund forecast. And then we'll review the enabling resolutions uh, before you this evening. So at the City Council goal setting workshop on March 18th, 2023, the City Council provided direction to the City Manager on how best to align resources and work plans for the coming fiscal year. The City Council identified five priorities, including housing, emergency preparedness, climate action plan, activating downtown and safe streets, Staff provided a detailed presentation on how the budget um, fed into these different priorities at both the June 1st public workshop as well as the June 13th public hearing. Now we'll be providing an overview of the budget changes. So since June 13th, staff has worked to clearly identify the annual and ongoing expenses for the service level enhancements that is provided in attachment H. Staff excluded the Menlo Park Community Campus additional staffing, which will be brought back for future consideration by the City Council. Staff excluded the police flock camera purchase, which will be brought back at a future study session for Council consideration. And the strategic pension funding reserve was used to maintain the additional payment for the unfunded accrued liability related to CalPERS. Overall, this resulted in a difference of the deficit increasing from 0.96 million to 1 million. Additionally, staff is expecting to bring back um, budget amendments during the fiscal year. These would include amendments for the successor labor agreements with our various bargaining units, 
analyzing the MPCC staffing levels, the use of special revenue funds, police flock cameras, and environmental justice element programming, as well as cultural and community event grant programming. So diving into our general fund five-year forecast, the forecast before you does incorporate the changes since June 13th. The emergency contingency reserve is maintained at the minimum policy levels throughout the forecast, while the economic stabilization reserve is used to cover deficits that are projected. In year three, the strategic pension funding reserve is supplemented with general fund for the overall $500,000 payment, and that continues at the same level using the general fund in years four and five of the forecast. And there are two scenarios that are presented for you in how the general fund supports the capital improvement program as their annual contribution. The first scenario is maintaining the $3 million contribution. This would result in the economic stabilization reserve decreasing to 2% in year five of the forecast and the unassigned fund balance decreasing to a quarter million in fiscal year 24-25. In the second scenario, the contribution to support the capital improvement program is reduced to 1 million per year starting fiscal year 24-25. In this scenario, the economic stabilization reserve decreases to 13% in year five, and the unassigned fund balance decreases to a quarter million in fiscal year 26-27. Something to consider is that the deferred maintenance costs do rise with the lower capital improvement plan contribution. So here is some uh, illustration of what happens to the economic stabilization reserve in these scenarios. So here we see that the reserve reaches a low point of 2% in the year five versus the $1 million contribution where it reaches the low of 13% in year five. And so in both scenarios, we're drawing down the reserve to cover deficits and the unassigned fund balance decreases to the quarter million, but the timeline differs on how fast we get there. These scenarios are meant to help give you an idea of how changes in expenditures impact the budget. And staff is also exploring revenue generating measures and staff will continue to research and apply for various grant opportunities as those opportunities arise. And so staff wanted to review the various resolutions that are before you this evening. So we have five resolutions and actions needed to enact the proposed budget. We'll go through each of those in turn. The first resolution is adopting the fiscal year 23-24 budget and the capital improvement plan and authorizing those related appropriations. This also authorizes the payments up to the budgeted amounts for things like the debt service on currently issued debt, utilities, employee benefits, intergovernmental agreements, and the IT internal services funds for the various hardware and software throughout the city. The next resolution is to adopt the appropriations limit. This establishes the appropriations limit at 78.2 million in order to meet the California government code requirements. The next resolution is to amend the salary schedule. And this salary schedule um, includes the previously negotiated wage increases for our police officers association and police sergeants association. Next, we have the resolution to extend the rate assistance program for the solid waste and water rates. This program was established to help promote equity and help low income households cover basic living expenses. And this resolution would continue the program to June 30th, 2024. And finally, the last resolution is to, for the award authority and bid requirements. So this sets the amounts and the approving authority as well as the bid requirements in various categories such as goods, general services, professional services, public projects, and claim settlement. And this would provide for a maximum limit of 93,000 for the city manager approving authority amount. And all amounts above this limit 
what must be brought forward to the city council for approval. And so finally, staff is looking for any final direction from the city council to incorporate into the proposed fiscal year budget and adopt the en enabling resolutions. The next steps would include publication of the fiscal year budget and staff will continue to research the possible transient occupancy tax TOT ballot measure in 2024. And with that, that does conclude our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, Mello, for that sobering <laughs> presentation. Um, so at this time, unless there's any burning clarifying questions, um, we'll open it up for public comment. Ms. Heron, please. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on regular business item J1, adopt resolutions for fiscal year 2023-24, adopting budget and capital improvement plan, establishing appropriation limits, amending the salary schedule effective July 2nd of 2023, extending rate assistance th program through June 2024, and accept award authority in big requirement through June 2024. Participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Okay, at this time I have one speaker and our first speaker will be Jeff Schmidt. Hi everyone, um, thanks for the presentation and um, just my name is Jeff Schmidt. I'm the vice chair of the Environmental Quality Commission, but tonight I'm an individual citizen of Menlo Park. Um, I'm here for the second time to, as you're considering the different appropriations, to make sure that you um, consider protecting the Urban Forest Master Plan as part of your capital improvement plan. Um, really, the first I want to say thank you because you made it a tier one priority in the first allocation um, process, in the first budgeting process. Um, and I understand that, you know, that inspired many of us who are working on this to continue that work. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about um, why we're asking to keep that in, even, <clears throat> even in this tough budget situation where you've got to make a lot of trade-offs. The um, the, as a reminder, the plan focuses on reducing the historical gap between the trees planted throughout the city, but also in the Bellhaven neighborhood. And that's 6,000 of our residents. It's 20% of the total population. It represents 85% um, of our Black population and 76% of our Hispanic population. So I know we're talking about a lot of issues around the environment and the disproportionate impacts, but this is a 40-year plan that's centered in that community. It's got a multiple benefit because it um, is a health issue for that population. Um, it's asthma and air quality is key issues. It's a heating and cooling issue. It's a quality of life issue. And finally, it's a climate issue. So with a small investment, it has multiple benefits. It's also multi-generational. Trees, I mean, as many of you know, that's... Um, that's a 40 year strategy that we're asking you to keep focus on funding. So it lasts for the life of our current citizens, their kids, their grandkids. It's a hundred year cycle at the trees that will last for generations. And then it's a multi-partner approach as well. So the reason why we feel strongly about protecting it is um, you've got a number of partners, Canopy, Bell, um, Bellhaven Empowered, Menlo Spark 350, CRC, they're all gonna be invited to a mid-July meeting to continue this work. And the signal that this sends to that group of community partners to keep marching forward is a strong one. So they'll continue with the planning and the implementation and helping to fund some of these pursuits. So it's a $250,000 request. It's a small request, it's seed money, um, but it mobilizes all these volunteers in the community to keep going to keep finding new funding sources to supplement it. It sends a super strong signal. It's $6,000, uh, 6,000 citizens, it's $41 a citizen. So I think that's an important thing to consider. Um, and then the final thought quickly is, you know, how many millions of dollars does the quiet zone issue take? Um, and that's probably what, 200 citizens? 
this is a hundred years from now, thousands of citizens in Bellhaven will continue to benefit from the support for this tonight. So as you're considering trade-offs, please consider keeping the urban forest master plan. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Ezio Alviti, and this will be the final call for public comment on our regular business item, J1. Yes, um, good evening, Council. Um, I'm, I just wanted to make a quick comment on some of the programs. When you try to access them using a screen reader uh, to get uh, these financial assistance, their websites don't play kindly with screen readers. And so I think it is important for the city when this occurs and goes to a third party that they observe accessibility standards. I don't know if that can be put into the language in some formal way, but they need to meet the WCAG, which stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.1 A. And if they don't, they will not play kindly with screen readers. And so I, I hope that in the future that this will be but into what's termed often as the boilerplate um, so that it's the city's expectations are known and they are met. So thank you, that, that, that was my, my comment. And also relative to the prior speaker, there are more than 200 of us who would benefit from a reduction in train noise. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. All right, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, uh, Ms. Heron, and thank you, Mr. Schmidt and Mr. Alvidi for your comments, and especially um, for, I, I saw staff members kind of writing notes about the accessibility issues. Um, so that's something I'm sure we'll be following up with. So thank you for that um, comment. So um, the task ahead of the council tonight um, is really to get the budget over the finish line um, by the end of this year, a um, couple of days. So um, there, the way I'm looking at the budget and all this information is, is kind of in two, two buckets. One bucket is the 23-24 budget. So this upcoming year, um, just getting this budget done. And then secondarily, the second bucket would be looking at our structural deficit and our five-year forecast, our long-term um, fiscal sustainability issues, which I think um, have really um, been illustrated, I hate to say beautifully, um, but that chart kind of showing the drawdown of our reserves is pretty daunting and kind of the necessary community conversation that we need to have about how do we address that? Because um, our, um, our situation really is we're either gonna need to make some big cuts or we're gonna need to find more revenue or some combination of, of the two because um, drawing down reserves is not a long-term strategy. Um, and we are looking at, you know, potentially if we're not paying into our capital improvement plan, looking at deferred maintenance, if we're not paying into our unfunded pension liability funds, um, that's just creating a problem down the road. Um, so I see that second bucket um, as kind of, as you had on that final slide, kind of the next step um, and really a continuing conversation um, that likely, um, given the conversation um, that we had at the June 13th meeting about a potential revenue generating measure, um, kind of culminating potentially on the November 24 ballot um, to have the community really weigh in on, are we willing to seek additional revenue to support the services that our residents and community want and expect? Because um, at the end of the day, we have to pay for it somehow. Um, and so that's not, I don't think, an answer we're going to have tonight. <laughs> um, and so um, that's why it's kind of the next step. And um, if I if I start with that second bucket, um, I also think that um, 
if we look ahead to kind of culminating around November 24, and you know, I don't have a crystal ball on which way we're all going to go, um, but if we look at cutting expenses, they're going to be painful expenses because the city has um, a set of required work that we have to do. We have to keep our residents safe. We have to keep our streets paved. Um, we have to um, meet our commitments through the housing element, the environmental justice element. Um, there's things that are not really up for discussion. They're kind of requirements. And so when we look at the discretionary cuts and expenses potentially on the table, those are all going to be really painful because um, those are going to be all the kind of the fun things that we as residents like to have in our city. And so I just want to encourage residents to kind of put a pin in that and start thinking about that as we start um, preparing to have a conversation about revenue generation, because the alternative is going to be somebody's going to get something taken away that they're quite used to having and, and enjoy very much. Um, so that's really not um, like my decision or even the council, we're going to want to hear from our residents. And so with that, um, I believe November 24 in the ballot um, is going to come before we know it. And so any kind of discussion that we need to have about um, what we want to put on that ballot potentially needs to kind of that the prep work needs to happen sooner than later. And that, I don't know if it's a study session or um, about what, what that's going to look like. And I know staff, you've already been looking at transit occupancy tax. Um, I know that was kind of the winning revenue measure that came out of the last meeting. I'd actually like to potentially open that up to other ideas. Um, I know that the utility user tax wasn't necessarily a popular one, uh, especially given the economy and inflation, but November 24 is a lot can happen between now and then. So I don't want to uh, necessarily limit ourselves, especially if there's an opportunity um, to, I don't know if it's polling or a survey, a community survey, really checking in with residents about these different concepts um, to help inform council um, decisions whether on what services um, residents may be willing to forego or what revenue um, measures residents will be willing to support. So um, in terms of next steps, I'd like to add on that, again, this is kind of the second bucket of future um, things, um, really getting going on that conversation of November 24. And if we need to get going on a survey um, having that get in the hands of um, residents sooner than later, I think is a huge priority um, for us to focus on. So um, that's my kickoff. I don't know, I see uh, Assistant City Manager Stolte coming to the table. I don't know if you wanna to respond to that. I've kind of just given a little monologue and, and um, um, but I know we're gonna be talking a lot about the 23-24 budget, but I feel like the elephant in the room to me is our outlook for the future. Um, which makes me at this state very um, nervous, I guess, um, wanting to keep the city in really good shape. So, Mr. Stolte. I appreciate the additional input on revenue generating measures. Uh, we would have an opportunity to explore more than a TOT, especially with a community survey. So if there are two that rise to the top, um, it would be great to walk away from this meeting tonight knowing that because we would be on a, on a tight timeline. So we would be running with that pretty quickly um, this summer. Thank you, Mr. Solde. So now that I kind of frame, like shared my framing of kind of that second bucket and our financial outlook, was there anything that Council Member Nash or Council Member Dorr, if you wanted to reflect on what I said or if there's a different direction you want to take us in at this time? Maybe starting by responding to the idea of the long-term opportunities, maybe um, would like to respond to that. And then maybe after council member Nash, if you have things to share there, we can go on to the other side. Um, but I would just like to say that I, I'm supportive of asking our residents what they want and where they see opportunities to increase revenues or cut costs. Um, so many of the programs, as the mayor said, uh, that that are on the agenda and are in, in this budget is options to cut are things that really are important to the city and make our city special. And so I think actually getting direct input from the community would be really good. And I know it's something that I am hoping to do, especially directly with, with my district, District 5, to talk with folks about what they want to see there. Um, but I would be in support of a, a survey going out to folks, TOT, talking about the UUT, the utility user tax 
I wonder also if there might be opportunities around special districts, um, given that a lot of the work we're trying to do is centered downtown and increasing the vibrancy there. Is that an opportunity? Um, or are there other special districts that we could conceive of? Um, I, I'm curious if, if that's something that you all have thought about or have, I mean, it's, it's been done previously. So I'm curious if along with that, if, what opportunities you see there and if there are other revenue generating options that maybe are worth putting in the survey. Council Member Nash. So I would like to um, hold off on direction on exactly um, on which, um, what we would like to put in the survey until we have all five members up here. I think that that's one decision that would be important to have everyone involved in. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think then the direction is an interest in seeking community feedback. Um, so I think we'd love for staff to come back very soon um, with some ideas of how to go out into the community to gauge um, feedback. I don't know if that's, if we have agenda room for that. Um, City Manager Murphy, I see you leaning forward. Uh, yes, I, I think this would be an example of something where we can make the agenda room because it's uh, extremely important. So I think to, for the next opportunity to have all five council members would be uh, July 11th. Okay, so I think um, that's an excellent time. Um, so I know Mr. Stulte, you were hoping to get at top two, um, but I think um, if you can come and maybe even, um, I don't know if there's any really high level analysis I know that it was in last, the June 13th staff report kind of lists out some different ideas and some ranges, maybe kind of coming back with that information. Um, also, perhaps if there's information on what other cities are doing, um, I was in a meeting, uh, a chamber meeting, and um, the mayor of Redwood City, Jeff G, was talking about how they too are running a structural deficit, which I believe a lot of the cities on the peninsula are, and that they're um, looking to go to their residents with the, a measure in November 24. Um, so perhaps if there's um, other insight into what our neighboring um, communities are doing, that would be extremely helpful as well. We can do that for July 11th. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so now that we've tackled our structural deficit, uh, <laughs> uh, is there are there comments, questions regarding the 23-24 budget with the huge acknowledgement that we are a little bit under the gun here to get this year across the finish line. Um, and with, again, a huge acknowledgement that we're also gonna have some budget amendments um, that are gonna further kind of dig us deeper, which will just elevate the urgency of figuring out our structural deficit um, that much more. So thoughts on the 23-24 budget, council members. Please, council member Nash. So I essentially um, think that we um, are headed in the right direction um, with the, there was slide five that talked about um, that we will be having um, service level enhancements um, excluded that right now, basically what the changes to the budget have been since the June 13th public hearing and what will need to come back. I'm very interested um, in looking at the Menlo Park Community Campus and the staffing there, but very strongly believe that that's a, um, something that needs to come back separately with much more information, um, as well as the police flock cameras. Um, so I'm, um, I am comfortable with where we are at this point with the budget, um, I guess on, as far as um, the two scenarios for the general fund five forecast, five year forecast, do you want to go that direction yet or not yet? I think that might be better. Uh, Stephen, uh, uh, Mr. Schulte, you look like you wanted to say something. So at the last meeting, we did receive direction <clears throat> to maintain the $3 million contribution. Those two scenarios are just illustrative just to kind of show you what that $2 million difference would do over the long term. So perfect. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Dorr. Thank you. I'm um, just responding to Council Member Nash. Um, on MPCC, I really appreciated in the 
agenda packet um, that library and community services included a pretty thorough slide deck that talked about how uh, the number of staff decreased quite significantly as we went into the pandemic from 2020 to 2021. And then it shows the slow creep upwards again and how by adding the six FTEs to support MPCC ready, that is in effect just adding 1.25 folks from who the number of people we had back in 2020. And I um, would like to have our vice mayor, uh, vice mayor Taylor in this room as we talk about MPCCs, given that it's in her district, um, but just wanna recognize that this is a really important resource for our community. And we have said that we want to provide the utmost quality of resourcing and services at that center. And that requires great people uh, to run the program. So there's actually something happening in that great new building we have. And so I, I just wanna say publicly that I'm very supportive moving forward with that six FTEs. I appreciate the work that's gone into the center and uh, would like to see that move forward. Um, and so I also wanna have uh, Vice Mayor Taylor's thoughts on this. Um, so I hope that we can bring this back quite soon to talk about it given that if programming is to start over the winter uh, when the new center opens in early 2024, that we need to move be, be moving now to uh, set aside that budget. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm, I, I struggled. I was leaning towards including it in the budget, to be honest. Um, I see, so over the last few months, we have heard, heard from our employees quite often coming to public comment and talking about um, staffing shortages and the high quality of service that our residents are accustomed to and expect. And um, having read the slides about um, the um, capacity in library and community services, thinking about um, potentially not staffing that department up sufficiently um, feels like it would place an even greater burden on our employees. Um, and to me, um, once the MPC project was kind of approved and moving forward, it seemed like we um, have a responsibility to staff it. Now, I know that the six employees that we're talking about could all we could move employees from one area to another, but then that would require reducing services um, potentially at the Burgess campus or in our other programs. And to me, that's part of that conversation that we are going to be having over the next um, you know, 15, 18 months or so, as we were talking about our structural deficit and that trade-off between um, are we able to let go of certain services um, or are we prepared to pay for them. And um, I don't think that we'll be able to have that full trade-off conversation about the level of service in library and community services um, by September or, or whenever this was going to come back to us. And so um, in the absence of having that kind of robust conversation and really letting the community know that there are services that would be gone potentially, um, without having that full, um, full, tra I don't know, not transparency, but that full um, conversation, um, that's hard for me. Um, so I, I, um, I'm also sensitive that we don't have our full council here tonight, and I believe the direction that we gave on the 13th was not to include it. So given that, um, I'm okay with that. I think um, just being fully um, clear with my colleagues, I find it hard to think that I wouldn't be funding it in the absence of, like I said, this big outreach about what we want as a community and what we're willing to pay for um, with library and community services. So I hope that made sense. Um, Council Member Nash. So I am, um, I feel very strongly that we need to have a discussion outside of this budget that we cannot budget it for it right now. There are, um, I have questions from the slides. Um, first of all, on the adjusted staff hours, 
Um, right now we have 25% adjusted across the board of FTEs for leaves and breaks. I think that that's something that we need to discuss and find out. This is on page J1.45. Um, I would like to know more about how these adjustments take place. I also have questions about the staff hours for core services. Um, the fact, anyway, including that, well, the staff hours needed per week for core services, I think is something that we could discuss. Um, thankfully, we've been already provide, all of this information has all, already been provided. I think we do have enough information to have a um, robust discussion around it. Um, I would not be, I would not support a budget that currently that includes the six FTEs. Um, so while we might be leaning in different ways or you've leaned all the way over, um, given that we don't have our full council, it does, I think, make a lot of sense to move forward as we discussed at the 13th meeting. Council Member Nash. Thank you. I do want to make it clear that we do have an excellent, um, just a wonderful new campus center opening, and we do need to be able to run the programs as robustly as has been described, and we just need to have a dis discussion about exactly um, how do we accomplish that, and perhaps we do need more people, but I think that that needs to take place in um, the context of a full discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Um, Council Member Dorr. Yes, I also want to talk just for a moment about the two other um, items that came up last week, uh, both regarding the police department, one for the community wellness and crisis response team. Um, we, we didn't talk about that separately from the flock cameras. And I want to call out that there are several different agenda or several different line items here uh, that were described in the agenda. And I'm very supportive of that work and that effort. Um, just to have that. And also coming back to the flock cameras, um, I appreciate that a lot of other communities are installing these devices um, in an attempt to improve safety for the community and also to in increase the effectiveness and use of data in making decisions and deploying resources out in the field. And we had some community members reach out to us saying, over over the CCIN that this is a that they've seen the benefits of this where someone maybe had something stolen and then because of the the flock cameras um, or the cameras out uh, in the community they were able to identify who did that um, and seeing that this resource of about eighty thousand a year is less than what adding just one new policeman would police person would be um, makes it quite compelling as well um, seeing as we don't have the full uh, council here, maybe this isn't the time to to put this back on the agenda uh, or back on the the budget, but just to to raise that as something that I'm thinking about as we continue to move forward and think about other um, costs that I I think will be or should be reflected in our budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. And as a reminder to members of the public that the council is subject to the Brown Act, which means um, we cannot discuss agenda items with each other, um, more than two of us. So this is an opportunity for members of the council to share our thoughts on things um, in a public forum. Um, so we might be expressing opinions. So we know where each other stands, even though we might not be taking direct action. So I appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Just following up on the flock, my understanding about the concerns regarding flock weren't necessarily financial concerns, which of course we have a budget issue, but they were more about privacy concerns um, and some concerns I believe raised by, um, I don't know if it's the ACLU or some other groups. Um, so just, just wanted to put that out there. Um, another item on the budget that I know is now being listed as a potential mid-year budget amendment um, has to do with the cultural and community event grant program. I just wanted to highlight that because um, we have discussed the need and the desire to have community events um, kind of return. And um, as you may all be aware, the Menlo Park Chamber of Commerce used to do various um, downtown events, the Connoisseur's Marketplace, and um, the city did some block parties. Um, some of these events were disrupted with the pandemic and now with staffing issues and budgetary issues. Um, so to me, um, I would love to see, by the way, we have a big 4th of July event coming up and maybe the city manager will 
uh, tell you about it during his report. But I think we all are craving kind of a return to community gatherings and um, these fabulous ways of, of us to come together. And we, the council had talked um, a while back about putting together a grant program for community groups to organize various community events, which I just think is lovely. Um, given the conversations we've had about the budget, um, I think this kind of ties into, you know, what, again, what do we want um, to have and what are we willing to pay for? So um, I just wanted to put a pin in that, that um, it's something that we said would be included in the budget and it kind of hasn't been, but now it's on the table for a budget amendment. But I think as we continue to have these conversations around potential cuts or revenue generation, this is the type of item that's kind of the trade-off that, that we're looking at. Um, were there any other council member door? Thank you. Uh, one other comment from me on the budget. Um, so last week we had our conversation around the environmental justice uh, elements and the need to fund that in, in some way. And I appreciate that some of my uh, comments about needing to look at grant programs that are coming down from the federal government, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, is reflected in this section. So in the uh, agenda packet, page J-1.3, it mentions that there's an opportunity to look at grant writing and grant support for that. And I wanna clarify that the opportunity for grants that I'm excited for extend, include efforts that are reflected in the environmental justice elements and projects there, but could also apply to other efforts the city is doing. Um, so just to name a few of the funds that are, are available right now, there's an, from the Department of Energy, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Grant Program, Residential Electrification Rebates, a Loan Program Office, Qualifying Advanced Energy Project Credits. From the EPA, there's a Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. From the IRA, there are tax credits for projects. And there's $600 million that just became available last week for climate resilience in the Bay Area. And so the opportunities I'm excited for us to explore as a city um, include things that we've listed in the uh, capital improvement plan. So things like um, prepping our city hall for solar, thinking about EV chargers for the city hall, thinking about other broader infrastructure improvements or completing the levy on, on the Bayfront to finish the last 30% that we need to do. So the opportunities I think that are here can apply to the general fund and all the other projects we have, as well as to some of the projects that we haven't yet reflected in our budget that are in the, that may be in the environmental justice element. And um, I had a chance to speak to the city manager about, uh, you know, just to check in to see what are some of the opportunities that you all are seeing, the city is seeing, uh, to make good on these opportunities and just explore funding. And so I'm curious if um, we could hear from staff about some of the avenues they might be exploring right now to uh, see what funding buckets might be most appropriate for our city. Thank you. One, um, one thing I can let you know that we're looking into is professional grant support and someone that does this for a living and for other agencies as well and can, you know, understand the full landscape of op opportunities out there um, and really has their finger on the pulse of where the funding is at right now. So that's, that's something we're looking into specifically next week or this week and next week. I can also say that, um, or, or, Nikki Nagaya, if, if you have anything to add, I know that um, there is grant writing support specifically for capital projects that uh, the Department of Public Works employs. So that's already part of our um, current contract services. And the police department also regularly seats, um, seeks and receives grant funding for various initiatives. So uh, following up then, is that work needing a budget appropriation or does that fall within whatever con work that you do without it, our permit? yes it will require a, a budget uh, amendment uh for the professional grant writing services that are more global in scope so okay so um is that something that you're prepared to ask for tonight or would that come back as a budget amendment it will be coming back as a budget amendment sooner than later yes thank you very much um, Councilmember Nash. Oh, Ms. Nagaya. 
Good evening, council members. So I was mostly making myself available if you had further questions, but what Mr. Stolte mentioned is correct. We have a number of engineering and transportation firms on um, a master agreements that we use kind of on a retainer basis. So as a grant opportunity arises, we can then work through that list of firms to, to select somebody who has the relevant expertise in topic areas. And so that has been really helpful in pursuing particularly um, some of the technical grant opportunities that are coming through the, the IRA and the IIJA and some of the other prior uh, federal funding programs that have come up recently. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to hear that because I know these pots of money won't sit there forever. And so it's great to hear that the city is uh, thinking strategically about this, exploring options to, to see how we can bring those resources in. So thank you. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, so I am also really excited about um, pursuing more grant opportunities. Um, I think one of the things that might be interesting is if we could get a list at some point of all the grant opportunities that we are currently taking advantage of, because I know we have a $50 million grant um, from FEMA to do the levies. I know that we have numerous um, grants through PC Peninsula Clean Energy to do the solar um, on our child care center, on some of the city hall. We also have um, EV chargers. So I think that um, while there's many opportunities out there. There's also many opportunities that we currently are pursuing and some have been successful, not all, um, but just getting more transparency there might be beneficial as well. Thank you. Do that, I think as part of the May 9th study session on the capital improvement program, there was a list of um, all the grant opportunities that we had pursued in context of the capital program with an update at that time. Um, but um, City Manager Murphy and I were just talking this week about the need to do something more regular um, so that you have kind of an update on on the grant opportunities um, from at least from the capital perspective. The the operating side may be slightly more challenging, take more more time to put together, but but we can put that um, on a, a request list for for next year. All right, then. So we discussed. The longer term structural issues, we've discussed the 23-24 budget and um, some topics there. Are there any other comments, questions? Staff, do you have any direction you're still seeking from us? Have we answered your questions? Um, so at this time, I'm open to entertaining a motion, if there is one. It's a big one. Council, so, uh, Councilmember Nash. Sure, I would move to adopt the resolutions for fiscal year 2023-24 and um, adopting budget and capital improvement plan, establishing appropriations limit, amending the salary schedule effective July 2nd, 2023 and bid requirement through 2024. Thank you for having that on the screen. And I will second that motion. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash and a second by City Council Member Doer to adopt the following resolutions, establish award levels and provide bid requirements. Uh, the first being a resolution adopting fiscal year 2023-24 budget and capital improvement plan. The second is a resolution establishing the appropriations limit. Resolution number three is amending the salary schedule effective July 2nd, 2023. The fourth is a resolution extending the solid waste and water rates assistance program through June of 2024. Number five is to accept award memo for authority and bid requirements through June of 2024. Any further city council questions or discussions? Um, I just want to acknowledge that there's only three of us here this evening. Um, but given that, I think we did kind of honor the direction that um, was expressed at the June 13th meeting. And so I, I might be speaking for us on here, but I think we're comfortable um, with just the three of us making this. And there's a state looming deadline um, to get the budget turned in. So with that, I, I think we're ready for the vote. Thank you. Thank you. So by roll call vote, City Council Member Doer. Yes. City Council Member Nash. Yes. And Mayor Willison. Yes. All right, and the motion passes with Vice Mayor Taylor absent and City Council Member Combs absent. Thank you. 
Thank you, City Clerk Heron. We are moving on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mello, um, Mr. Davis, everyone who was involved, Mr. Stolte, in the budget creation. It's the culmination of a lot of work to get it approved. Um, sadly, we'll see you again soon to talk about the structural issues, but we appreciate all the work that went into this. Um, all right, we're moving on to J2, um, which is to review and authorize staff to submit the revised housing element for the 23 to, 20, to 2031 planning period to the California Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD. And to introduce this item is Principal Planner Tom Smith. Mr. Smith, please. Good evening, City Council. Um, I have with me Assistant Community Development Director Deanna Chow and Mr. Jeff Bradley from the M Group, who's been the city's consultant on the housing element update project. We have a brief presentation for you this evening. All right, next slide, please. So the last time that we were with you um, to discuss the housing element in particular was on January 31st. And that was when council adopted uh, the housing element. Shortly thereafter on February 8th, um, staff sent the housing element to HCD, the, De the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, for review. And this all occurred after an extensive process of public engagement and coordination with uh, various community stakeholders. The housing element was developed to meet the city's regional housing needs allocation, which we also call RENA for short, of a little under uh, 3,000 net new units across all incomes over uh, an eight year period through 2031. And it also establishes policies and programs that set the framework for the city's housing related actions uh, to occur over that eight year period. So following uh, the submittal of the housing element on February 8th, HCD performed its review and sent a letter on April 7th requesting some additional changes to the document. Next slide, please. So HCD's comments on our adopted housing element is that it addresses many of the statutory requirements that are set out by state law, um, but they did have some comments in the following general topic areas. Um, there were comments around affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is another acronym AFFH that we use uh, in regard to the housing element. Some uh, comments around the housing sites inventory and realistic capacity calculations. Um, an analysis of constraints that would potentially reduce housing development and how the city would propose to uh, manage those, those constraints. And then addressing our programs in the housing element in chapter eight with some more specificity and concrete actions. So nearly all of the requested changes were for more detail um, and more data to support information that was already included in the January 31st adopted housing element. Next slide, please. So very high level, um, there, the changes that, that the project team has made to the housing element in response to that, uh, the letter from HCD that we received in April, um, you can find an overview of those in attachment D of the staff report, which provides a detailed summary and uh, in line with each HCD comment that was included in that letter. And we also did uh, review correspondence. We had meetings with uh, commenters on the housing element, interested parties. And so we also um, made some responses to those changes as well uh, as part of that attachment D document. Next slide, please. So just to give you a kind of flavor of the changes, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but some examples uh, for program H1H, we did add a commitment to a mid cycle check-in in 2027 with city council. And that is really to evaluate our uh, process in meeting our arena, again, regional housing needs allocation of about 3,000 units that, that I mentioned at the beginning, um, and seeing where we are in making that progress. And if, uh, if we feel that we're falling short, then city council can direct some potential additional zoning changes or new incentives, um, explore the whole range of options to, to help us get back on track with meeting our arena. Uh, I would add for this, though, that Council will also see annual progress reports that we are required to submit to HCD every April, 
And generally, um, we bring those to council in the, the March timeframe. And so in addition to that mid-year check-in, you will get an annual update on how we are progressing all along the cycle. Program H3G, uh, this expands the number of beds that are allowed by right in the emergency shelters for homeless overlay. Um, it said 16 before, but to comply with state law, we have changed that to 30. Program H4J, we'd be looking at development standards for R3 properties, um, an evaluation of those to reduce constraints and help proposals uh, achieve the maximum allowable densities in those areas. So looking at things like floor area ratios, um, landscaping requirements, things like that, that, that could constrict development on those sites and, and making it a little bit easier to get through that development process. Program H7A, uh, we would e establish some objective standards for projects that require architectural control review. We, we did some additional analysis of our findings and found that some of those are subjective and they're a little too squishy. And so we would be tightening those up to give some more clear direction to the development community on how they could comply with uh, our arch architectural control requirements. There's also a new appendix 7-7. That is a matrix of our inventory sites. It gives an overview of kind of the development typology, um, potential redevelopment factors that could be applied to the sites and incentives um, that are either regulatory or do the nature of the environment of where the site is located, um, we think will encourage redevelopment. And we also have a list in that uh, appendix of example projects from Menlo Park and other Bay Area jurisdictions that help to support uh, redevelopment likelihood by showing actual projects that have either been approved or uh, constructed. And then finally, we did add some updates within the letter on information regarding large project sites. In particular, HCD had called out uh, a few different projects. So we did provide an update on what we know at this time about the Willow Village project, the USGS site, the former flood school site, um, 795 Willow Road, the VA project there. And so those updates are included within the letter. Next slide, please. So um, one other change that we would like to, to note is that following feedback that we received from HCD and also from meetings with community members and, and feedback uh, through correspondence, the project team does recommend removal of the post office site. That was site number 63, and that's located at 3875 Bohannon Drive. Uh, we would recommend removal from the site inventory of that particular site. And the rationale behind that was that although the site does have certain factors, redevelopment factors, certain incentives that, that indicate some redevelopment potential um, that were included in the, that appendix 7-7, there are some unique circumstances around this this property and that it is owned by the federal government. Um, interest in the government selling that site is, is unknown. And because of the, the ownership, um, there, there will be a disposition process, relocation of the postal facilities, potential timing of the sale if there were to be at some point an interest uh, throughout the planning period, um, it would just probably extend beyond, beyond the eight years that we're looking at. So that's, um, the rationale there. It would result in the loss of 85 potential moderate income sites from the site inventory, but that would not affect our overall ability to accommodate our arena in the housing element. Next slide, please. So next steps, um, if, if council authorizes staff to resubmit the housing element to HCD, we have a seven day public review period that we're currently within. That would end this Thursday, June 29th. And then the project team would prepare any final changes based on feedback from this meeting in the, the comment period as warranted and submit that housing element uh, with revisions to HCD. Council's action this evening would be to confirm the proposed revisions and authorize staff to, to resubmit the document. We're not asking for a readoption at this time. HCD would, would then take another 60 day review period um, and and during that time, we, we have had a discussion, a meeting with HCD. Uh, they indicated willingness to, to have check-ins, meetings, uh, discussions with us during that 60-day review period if they see things in the draft that will help us um, get it across the line, if you will. 
um, they've indicated that willingness to, to work with us on that. So during that 60 day review period, um, we anticipate working with HCD and that would get us to late August, early September, somewhere in there. And then if HCD were to certify after that review, then we would bring the document back to housing and planning commissions for a recommendation. And then city council would reconsider or would consider re-adoption of the document later this fall. Next slide, please. So we also wanted to note some other um, upcoming milestones. During this summer, uh, we anticipate planning commission and city council study sessions on zoning changes to the El Camino Real downtown specific plan. That is one of the programs in the housing element. And so um, working towards implementation of the document and um, having those discussions is, is on the radar. In the fall, we would have study sessions on other zoning changes that are uh, within the implementation programs in the housing element. So looking at our commercial districts, making those mixed use districts, um, changing some of our R3 parcels around downtown to allow additional densities and uh, looking at our affordable housing overlay and, and increases in densities to incentivize affordable housing development. Um, that will be another set of study sessions in the fall of this year. And then in late fall, um, or early winter, we plan to return with all the feedback, um, comments from council and the public that we've received on those zoning changes and have um, hearings to, to implement those um, by early 2024. And so uh, we, we see the zoning as part of implementation of this housing element, it goes hand in hand. And during that review period with HCD, um, we will be sharing those those study sessions and the ideas with, with the public and council during that review time. Next slide, please. And so staff would encourage um, anyone who's interested in the process, who's been engaged, who's watching uh, to, to remain engaged. Um, we will provide updates on some of those tentative milestones as we get more clear dates on the schedule. We will be updating our project webpage um, at menlopark.gov slash housing element, and you can find all of the latest information there. And with that, um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, so are there any clarifying questions on the diets? Nope. So City Clerk Karen, can you please um, open up public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on regular business item J2, review and authorize staff to submit the revised housing element for 2023 to 2031 planning period to the California Department of Housing and Community Development. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. So at this time, I am seeing four speakers. And our first speaker will be Jackie, followed by Adina Levin. Jackie, you can go ahead and engage your microphone now. I am sorry, Jackie, I don't believe we're able to hear you. I see that your microphone is engaged. Um, are you talking about Jackie Ishimura Ogachina? Who's ever speaking now is on, has their hand raised and is ready to provide comment. That's name not is me. Listed as Jackie. No, my comment would be on the EV equipment is when I would like to speak, not now. Okay. So there must be some ahead. sort of mix up. Oh, no problem. I'll go ahead and lower your hand and you can um, raise it for item J3. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we will go to Adina Levin, followed by Olivia Grimes. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. 
Um, hold on one moment, Adina. Can't seem to hear you too well. Um, oh, that's, much better. that's yes. better. Okay, great. Um, so, um, uh, Dean Levin, um, Menlo Park resident, and um, speaking to the letter that was sent by Menlo Together and a number of other groups that have been uh, closely following the housing element process with the goal of uh, strong support for the city. Uh, uh, successfully adopting a housing element that is approved by the state, uh, achieving the goals of planning uh, realistically for housing for people of all income levels um, in our city, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing and uh, protecting renters in our community. And um, so uh, we uh, wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, staff for uh, work on this so far, including refinements that added uh, specificity uh, to the programs. Um, uh, in particular, one of the items that we had said in the letter was um, concern about the lack of specificity about the uh, timeline and, and other specifics in the process of the uh, zoning for the downtown and our three areas. Um, in the staff report that was presented um, that had a, a number of very specific uh, dates and milestones moving forward on this, um, which I am uh, very glad to see that uh, moving forward in a timely manner, um, especially since um, some of our concerns continue to be that there are some other sites uh, in the city, in the housing element, where um, HCD had called out the uh, lack of a realistic evidence that they're going to be redeveloped um, as a housing and especially as affordable housing. Um, and um, there are downtown sites, especially the city owned parking lots that have an extremely uh, realistic uh, potential to redevelop as affordable housing and therefore really uh, assertively moving forward on these excellent location likely sites is very good to see moving forward and hope that the city council um, continues to uh, move forward with those plans. Um, uh, with the potential uh, inclusion of uh, increased zoning for the R3 areas that have many people who are uh, Menlo Park community members living there now, that is uh, all the more uh, motivation to uh, move ahead with the anti-displacement measures that are um, included in the plan. And last but not least, uh, funding, um, which has been mentioned as something the city needs to work on. Um, and the housing element, anti-displacement and affordable housing is included in one of the things that as a city, we will need funding for. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Olivia Grimes, followed by Jenny Michelle. Hi, can y'all hear me okay? Yes, go right ahead. Awesome. Um, so good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Olivia. I'm a staffer at the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Um, I just wanted to speak today to uphold the great work Mental Park has already done with the element and also propose some further improvements. Uh, the city has committed a number of public parking lots for affordable housing. Um, and this is one of the largest land contributions in the county, so that's really commendable. Um, the element also has a solid set of protections for tenants, um, which we believe would substantially reduce dis displacement and further fair housing in the city. Um, at the same time, the draft still misses some big opportunities. Um, the city has designated some non-vacant lots as opportunity sites, um, but the city's zonings, uh, zoning codes in these areas might still be a really big constraint. Um, the city still claims that a number of parking lots at large office developments will become middle to low density affordable housing. Um, and it's just worth pointing out, this is some of the most valuable venture capital real estate in the world. Um, so we believe that the city will need to take more specific policy steps towards addressing the constraints uh, at challenging sites like these. Um, the element has some incremental changes in this regard, but they can do a lot more. And we'd like to see some more improvements in that regard. Uh, Menlo City staff are trying really hard to help the city comply with state law, um, but they can't make greater zoning changes without some direction from the city council. 
Um, I'd like to point the council and staff towards Menlo Together's downtown zoning proposals, which was mentioned by the last speaker, um, but these would substantially address many of these major constraints. Um, at the end of the day, uh, increasing density in the city's highest resource neighborhoods is the clearest and simplest way Menlo Park can comply with state law and, of course, create the best possible plan for affordable homes. Uh, so all that said, thanks for the chance to comment, and I look forward to seeing what the city comes up with next. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Jenny Michelle, followed by Catherine. And this will also be the final call for public comment on regular business item J2. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, staff. I'm Jenny Michelle, longtime renting resident, mom of IEP student, recovering homeless teacher, City Clerk Judy fan club member and bringing you bad news tales from the depleted, unstable labor force crypt. Another great job staff hat tipped. For the record, I support and am happy to pay increased taxes of all kinds to help Menlo, especially to fund additional staff services for new community center and housing requirements with an auto 5% annual pay increase built in. My comments. One, side note, our city population is aging, contracting, and our youth have to move away. Keeping our youth workforce here is now the gold standard. The library could host a speaker series for teens to help them guide them through how to be homeless in Menlo Park instead of, instead of some other non-essential topics. Two, Safeway Lot was removed, correct? Three, Housing density, driving market force and market interest in housing density. We have like 25% appetite for welcoming neighbors. We leave a lot on the table by excluding our workforce living near us. We need a mechanism to ensure we generate public interest for housing density. Hold quarterly city outreach and training regarding benefits of housing density. Allocate hours of staff dedicated to this goal to increase to 50% first year and 10% each year after. Pay for this with increased business license fees for businesses with more than 100, 100 employees, etc. Four, note that housing density or infill helps climate resilience and climate restoration, public health and safety, reducing vehicle use, increasing body movement, connectivity towards neighbors, reducing loneliness, increasing vibrancy, mental health, music, art, local business or uh, spirituality, um, boost, uh, economic boost to municipality and local businesses, emergency preparedness, local able-bodied labor is invested in the community because we live here and we could be a deep, rich, beefed out infrastructure where we're just fully climate resilient. This is within our capability, people, okay? Stabilize schools and keep enrollment up to ensure funding helps evaluation and corrects the historic market manipulation. Five, our collective elephant in the room is still our R1 zones. Let's be effective to the state and get that cash money, y'all. Why not eliminate all minimum lot size above 10,000 square feet? Yes, I'm suggesting something aggressive, but we want to open the door and get those funds to exceed our arena numbers. It's a carrot bouquet. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Catherine, followed by Brittany Baxter. Hi, good evening, Catherine Dumont, Menlo Park resident um, and uh, renter. Um, and I wanted to, um, I was really moved by the climate um, action uh, discussion earlier, all the young folks um, speaking to their concern about the future. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, we had the a really great event of bridging the climate and housing gap um, that um, was really informative and talked about the um, uh, the international the IPCC that um, coming out and saying that housing is 
a critical strategy to reduce emissions. Um, and that um, we know that infill housing has the biggest impact on the reduction of greenhouse gases. So we're learning a lot um, and that we can apply here um, specifically in the downtown area and um, in other high opportunity areas of Menlo Park. Um, the zoning changes that we need are a no cost path um, to reduce emissions. And um, we really need to consider those um, highly. Uh, their language, and I, I really appreciate the SOP's work on, on the housing element so far, and the council's attention and the council's priority on housing uh, that was set in March. Um, I think that the, uh, the language about the downtown zoning um, and other and the um, opportunities um, to, to build on, on real sites, um, there, those are two areas that I'd really like the staff and the council to consider um, strengthening and um, making more realistic. Um, and thank you for your, your time. Thank you for your comment. Right, and our final speaker will be Brittany Baxter. Hi, good evening. This is Brittany Baxter, D3 resident. First, thank you again, council members, staff, consultants, any commissioners who are listening for the thousands of hours that I think have probably gone into this update. I know it's a really big lift. Um, I just wanted to briefly comment on sites and downtown zoning. So first, um, I've been thinking a lot about how some of the office buildings on our sites list seem to have large vacancies or prolonged vacancies, like for lease signs out front for a long time, um, or sometimes both, which when coupled with good zoning might encourage these owners to explore more mixed use or residential options for those properties that might be in a little bit more demand than just pure office space. So I did some Googling last night and I was able to find a decent amount of space for lease in the office buildings on our site list. It's a little bit striking to see kind of the extent of that and the office slump, you know, really region wide. Um, but at the same time, it gives me hope that maybe the story of Menlo Park's housing element can become that we're really uniquely positioned to capture this moment in time by leading on office to residential conversions um, in that particular area. So I just wanted to mention that um, about the vacancies that I was able to find in case the city might wish to describe some of these vacancies in the sites analysis that HCD recently requested, since I think um, kind of leases and availability in the building may be something that HCD considers. And then separately, one thing I noticed in my late night Googling is that a lot of the downtown sites, which are often single story used for retail or services, kind of looked like they were a little bit more fully utilized, fully leased. There you know, wasn't really availability, and we all know a lot of those great businesses downtown. And so that tells me that downtown rezoning is likely to be um, driven more by, or sorry, downtown turnover is going to likely be more driven by rezoning um, versus just kind of uh, those sites being the plan, especially for some reuse sites that are on here for a second cycle in a row. Um, so just wanted to also, you know, share my full support for more specificity around our downtown rezoning plans. Definitely looking forward to those conversations later this year to help transform our downtown into one that's really vibrant, walkable, mixed use, um, and providing homes for those who are already here in the community, you know, contributing, living, working every day um, as we get a wonderful downtown and city out of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I am seeing no further hands or cards. Meryl Wilson, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron, um, and thank you to our public commenters on this item. Um, following up with staff on some of the comments and questions that came from the public comments, I'm actually starting with the last one, um, Ms. Baxter. Um, she also sent in an email with an attached spreadsheet, which is pretty incredible. It's just a testament to the residents we have in our community that um, do this kind of research for us. Um, I think there's a real desire on behalf of residents and community members to see our housing element um, accepted by the state and really feeling good about, you know, what, what the direction we're moving in. And so um, Ms. Baxter is kind of offering some research that she did to show vacancy rates. Is that something that you see yourselves as staff um, looking, because I believe Mountain View or Redwood City incorporated that 
kind of information into their um, housing element to the state. Is that information that you find useful or um, how do you plan on, what do you plan on doing with that kind of information? Obviously you would have to check her work, um, but yeah, if there's any comments on that. Hi, Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mayor Wilson, Jeff Bradley, M Group. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. Uh, we did take a quick look at the spreadsheet and uh, Ms. Baxter uh, did identify about a third of the properties had a, a link uh, that took you to information about the leasing opportunities on those sites. So the short answer to your question is yes. Any information we can gather around vacancies um, on the opportunity site properties uh, can be helpful. Thank you. And then following up on the comments, um, particularly from Ms. Levin, and I believe she's um, highlighting a letter sent in by Misha Sillen and um, some other folks um, about, I think the net point being made has to do with zoning and kind of the link. Can you explain to us the linkage between the zoning conversations we're going to be having imminently and the housing element that we're submitting. And how is it that we can go ahead and submit the housing element prior to having those zoning conversations? What, what's the relationship um, between them? I'll give and, a and the deadlines too, if you can kind of walk sure. not only me, but the community who might be trying to follow along as well. Thank you. I'll give a brief um, housing element focused answer and then ask my colleagues on planning staff to give a more process oriented uh, community uh, answer. Uh, from a housing element perspective, the housing element itself establishes the broad policy uh, for land uses, uh, as we've been discussing for the past two years. Uh, zoning is considered an implementation item. Uh, zoning is subordinate to the general plan and is meant to implement the general plan. Um, there's, some, there's some misunderstanding around zoning. It sort of has a higher profile than the general plan in the public's imagination, and it is codified in law, so it feels like it's more more real um, than the than the general plan policies, uh, which provide high level policy uh, guidance to the decision makers, the planning commission and, and the council, and the other boards and commissions. Uh, but it's important to remember that the zoning simply implements uh, what's outlined in the policy documents. In this case. Uh, the housing element. In terms of the, the timing issues, um, I'm going to defer to um, planning staff. To, to build on uh, what Mr. Bradley said, I think we it, generally to, to kind of restate the the housing element is really putting into place um, our actions that we're going to be taking related to the development of housing in the community. And the zoning piece is us taking those actions and moving forward on on the housing element um and we have a goal of of doing that you know by january of next year and so i think that while this document is under review by hcd in discussions with them they've indicated that they're willing to have a dialogue with us throughout that 60-day review process and so i think they will be able to see some of the, the staff reports, the messaging, the conversations that are going to be coming to city council and the community as well will have an opportunity to weigh in. I think we view the housing element as really the floor for development and our commitments and the zoning discussions that we'll be having during the summer um, will message kind of above and beyond that uh, council's willingness to, to look at some of those expanded increases. So this is, this is our our floor, and then we'll figure out where the ceiling is through through the summer on those zoning discussions. So if we um, said, oh, great, we turned in our housing element, yeah, we don't feel like doing any zoning changes. Like, is that, I'm not proposing that, but just for community members who are wondering kind of what are we doing, what's going on, is this a choice to do zoning? No, uh, uh, state law um, that HCD uh, enforces requires all cities to implement their zoning uh, within one year. Is that right? If I could add to so that. So there is a hard hard deadline of January 31st of, of 2024. 
And, and Mayor Wollaston, if I may, and I concur with what um, Mr. Bradley indicated, given the timing of when the city um, adopted its housing element and still awaiting um, HCD's determination of compliance or certification. There are also statutory implications if the city does not take any action to adopt its zoning. So because the zoning is necessary to provide the capacity to meet your arena allocation, um, there are statutory um, penalties, if you will, if the city does not undertake the steps to adopt that zoning in the time frame required. Thank you. Thank you. Um, turning it over to, it looks like Council Member Dora has something to say, please. Yes, and maybe another clarifying question here to help to help me as well as the public. Um, there's zoning conversations, but there's also the affordable housing overlay with the kind of incentives that we're creating for uh, affordable housing developers, parking reductions, increased densities, all these different things. Is it all wrapped up under the term of zoning or are there other things that will be coming to us as well um, that the community can give and put on as, as well? So I think these are described under different programs in the housing element. Um, so you, and there's certain timing that's set out for each one. So each program, you know, say it's updating parking standards for certain districts. In the housing element, it specifies that we plan to do this by a certain date, uh, 2024, 2025. So you may not see everything together as one batch. You may see certain things coming together if they are interlinked. And we think that we need one to help explain the other and give you a, a comprehensive view of, of something. Um, but I think you, you'll be seeing these really throughout the, the early part of the cycle and then probably continuing through as well um, as, as we have capacity and, and ability to make those changes. So um, the housing element, the commitments that we are tied to in the document that we would be resubmitting, what then does that dictate for us in the zoning implementation? Are we, are we committing to a floor level of zoning changes and then the community can decide if we wanna go higher than the floor? Right. Um, or, or are we looking, or, cause I think there's some concerns that I've heard from the community that the floor, even if it's okay, right now with the state, because I think that there's certain guidelines that the state gives where you can count things for certain things that there's a minimum base density. But I think there's a, also a concern. There's, there's kind of a two-parter. One is getting this, accept, getting this into the state year one. And then there's the annual progress reports. And we have an eight-year cycle where we need to demonstrate to the state that we're making good on the projections that we have in the initial housing element draft. So I think there's a concern that if we rely on some of these lower base numbers, that they're not going to yield, even if they're accepted in this first hurdle, that the um, mid-year check-in or the ongoing um, development isn't going to work out. We might not get what we think we're going to get because it's not really market driven, it's more on paper. And so um, I'm not quite sure what my question is. Uh, yes, do you have any thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, you had a, you had a, a, a straight up question in the very beginning. Uh, we asked about whether these densities are the floor or not. And like what planner Tom Smith indicated, um, they are seen as the floor, right? Because if we tell HCD we're doing 20, 30, 40, 50 units per acre, and they see that on paper, that that is the minimum that the city could implement. If we come back through a community process with the zoning, and we wind up uh, with higher numbers uh, from HCD's perspective, that's that's all that's all to the good. And so the short answer to that first part of your statement question was was yes, that is definitely the floor. And we've, we've tried to communicate that through the wording in the programs in the housing element. So for instance, in talking about the specific plan program H4L, it, one, of the, um, one of the changes that we commit to is to increase the maximum base level density to at least 30 dwelling units per acre. So there's a lot of that language of kind of setting in place the minimums that we, we commit to. And then 
zoning discussions would lead to discussions above above that minimum we commit to. And um, how, so basically the study session that's gonna be coming up, and I, I hope the community starts hearing this and puts this on their calendar to participate, is really looking at the downtown specific plan, kind of like opening it up. Is that accurate? And then I guess my question becomes, the downtown specific plan was the product of years and years kind of community outreach. Um, how do we square that long um, zoning process with what we have on our timeline as a study session in the summer, and then boom, we need to like adopt these zoning changes by January 2024. That's a six month period versus I don't remember, Ms. Chow, you, you might have been, I don't know who was here during the downtown specific plan. Um, so how how does that how does that work? Thank you, Mayor Willison. Yes, that that is um uh, yeah, how how does that work? And we're gonna have to think about through our community engagement. I know um the downtown specific plan was. Uh, a visioning process that led into then the creation of the document itself. And so we're here looking, I wouldn't say it's opening up the entire document. I think we are looking at keeping it uh, fairly focused on ways to help create and incentivize housing that may lead into other areas. You know, I know we talked about economic vitality and vibrancy and are there other sort of tweaks that we may be able to do, but I, I would say our, our primary focus is looking at um, densities for residential potentially uh, you know, ways to enhance the mixed use opportunities of that becomes more attractive of a use. Um, so while we're looking into uh, making revisions to the specific plan through specific amendments, um, I, I wouldn't characterize it as opening the entire document up. I guess my follow-up question is, um, and I don't have the downtown specific plan in front of me, but I remember there's a page in it that kind of outlines the goals of the downtown specific plan. And one of the top goals, the downtown, I think it's the top one says maintain the village character. And then it goes on about revitalization and activation and, and spur, you know, um, development. Um, are we going to be kind of revisiting that village concept? Because um, as we talk about higher densities and kind of what folks were thinking back when the downtown specific plan was adopted versus what we might conversations we might be having next month or whenever we will be how how do how do we deal with potentially an inconsistency at least with what was then thought of village character um, which potentially might be have evolved since then yes thank you so it might be starting the conversation with what do we envision these densities to look like and then making other parts of the document change for consistency. So if our definition of village character changes, um, we may define it. I think we can then look at some of those other elements in the document for consistency. And all this is happening between this summer and January 24? Yes, and that's why I'm saying it's going to be focused on okay. a lot of the density and then some of the other development regulations that, as I believe Council Member Dor discussed, you know, we're talking about um, parking, there may be other like open space reforms, other things that might um, be seen as potential impediments to development. Those are the things that we'll also be uh, looking at um, or heights, increases in heights. Um, those kind of go hand in hand with increases in density. So given how compressed, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues in just a moment, <laughs> given how compressed and rapidly these conversations are going to be taking place, and they need to be done by January 24, and it's kind of our opportunity to do this. Um, I know you said the community engagement folks will be looking at this. Um, is there any direction that the council can give on kind of turning the dial on that because um, I want to make sure it's loud and clear to residents what's about to take place in the next few months um, because I worry a little bit that if anyone's asleep at the wheel um, between now and January 24 they might wake up and things could be very different I just 
the worst thing is people say, I didn't know, um, and that they didn't, weren't heard. Any thoughts on, um, is there more resources or outreach or, um, or is there a plan in place or can you come back with the plan so we can have some sense of comfort about feeling like residents are in the loop on this? So, yeah, so there's different kinds of engagement. So I think we're looking at community engagement. Certainly we're looking at property owner engagement. So we have previously sent out letters to all of the um, potential housing opportunity sites to let them know to stay involved in this conversation. Um, we'll be looking, you know, are there ways to do, um, like we did with the environmental justice element and safety element update, looking to put up our messaging boards, um, you know, but is there a way to do a postcard? Um, but we are, as you mentioned, impressed with timing. Um, I, I am concerned that coming back with an engagement plan, you know, might stall some of the work that we're doing on the zoning, which we're looking to yeah. come back in, in the near future. And so, um, you know, if there are ways that you feel are great to communicate with the yeah. members of the public, One, we're happy to take that in they, tonight. I, and I appreciate that. One idea I just had sitting here was, I know that the downtown specific plan probably included some type of email list or distribution list of people who are very plugged into that. Um, that seems like an important um, mailing list to potentially revisit um, to let, because if they were engaged enough back then, they might be interested to know what changes we have um, moving forward. Um, and then we obviously have a lot of people since then who've gotten very involved. Um, okay, I'm going to stop asking questions and talking, and um, I'm curious to hear what my colleagues have to say. Councilmember Nash? Thank you for all the comments, because I think that that highlights how much we need to push for, how much, this is not, so, how much we need to um, push forward and really get working on the zoning rather than iterating too much on the housing element plan, which um, would, if we had a different timeline, that would be great. But I think at this point, we really need to um, move ahead and start actually implementing these items um, or working on the zoning and all. Um, I think, um, well, actually just some, comments. Um, first of all, as soon as we can get some dates um, published as early as possible for any study sessions, any information, um, that would be really helpful, even if they are put out as tentative dates. Um, because we are in the middle of the summer, people are on vacation, as you know, um, I think the more people can plan ahead for these dates, um, the better, and maybe with a, in bold putting tentative, but at least people can understand that they're out there. Um, and also as part of that, I think the more transparency we can have as to what is happening, um, the better I realize it's a trade-off because it takes time to be more transparent, such as that these letters went out. Um, but to the extent that um, there can be more information available um, about what is happening, that would, I think, um, reassure everyone that um, a lot of work is going on and we're moving in the right direction. Um, so I guess I would like to see us um, wrap up the housing element and get it off to HCD, keep the um, strong connection with them, communication open and get going on the zoning um, is my two cents. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Councilmember Dorr? Yes, um, I am in full support of, of moving forward and really appreciate to the framing of, uh, you know, we've done, the city has done great work, the staff did great work and trying to refine and add more detail. Um, and now it's time to get that out and to focus our conversation on that zoning and on these other pieces that I mentioned about the affordable housing overlay, incentives that we can create for affordable housing developers, parking standards, there's a lot of other conversations and uh, along with having a better sense of when we'll have the conversation on zoning, uh, it would be also helpful to know when those 
kind of combined and other relevant conversations will be happening as well. Um, and looking through the 1,270 pages of the housing element, um, I didn't see too many mentions of the, like saying that this summer, this fall, we are having these conversations, we are doing X, Y, Z to, to build those standards, understanding that what we have is a ceiling and we're looking at going, or sorry, what, what we have is a floor and we're looking to go even higher. And so as uh, if you're looking to add uh, any anything else to the housing element, that seems like something just to, to mention the intention of these conversations uh, with the city uh, as a whole in these study sessions and conversations with the public, I think it would, would be helpful in showing HCD our commitment as a city. And I do have one comment on the housing elements of a, a small rewrite I'd appreciate, given that we haven't had the conversations as a city about, for one, uh, the parking standards. On page 8-28 of the housing element, um, it kind of does something a little bit different than other places, and it gives a specific range for what the, the parking standards might be revised to. Um, and I would propose that right now we just say that we will be reducing multifamily parking ratios and wait to include specific numbers for what those new ratios and what those new standards are until we have that conversation as a staff or as a, as a council with the staff. Thank you. If I may clarify, is that, is that with regard to program H4M at the bottom of page 8-28? I'm, the page is loading, so I can't actually get to the I section can, right away. I can read it as well if it would be helpful. Yes, h4.m. Yes, we can we can um, soften that language so that it, it does give more opportunity to explore those through future actions that the council will take. Thank you. And will the city be able to provide a sense of dates for when that conversation will come back? Or is that amorphously happening this fall? So the timeline, uh, the time frame that's indicated for this program H4M parking requirements and design standards is within one year of housing element adoption. So it should be occurring um, you know, prior to January of, of 2024. Thank you. So um, are you looking for a motion? Yes, if we could have a, a motion and a, and a vote to affirm these changes and, and give us direction to, to send to HCD, we would appreciate it. Okay, so if we're interested, and um, can you please repeat back the change that Council Member Dorr was proposing? Yes, it would be, uh, so the red line says reducing multifamily parking to one space per studio unit and 1.25 spaces per one bedroom unit. Um, and so it would say, including reducing multifamily parking. So it would just take out the specificity. Right. Okay. And we'll be discussing that at a later date, the specificity. And if I may, uh, we did hear from HCD in discussion with them and, and uh, their interest is in a specific number. We can make the revision at the direction of council, um, but I think during that 60 day review period, if, if we are pressed for it, um, we can certainly communicate back to you, but there may be a, a desire for us to get more specific on this particular one. Thank you. And I would love for us to be able to get that, get more specificity, but I'd like to have that conversation with the other council members. Council member Nash. My recollection is we had a conversation about parking. I don't know if it was specifically about this. That was for SB nine. Thank you. All right. Um, and then I guess it, I would, defer to staff if they think that we need a number, realizing that that's a floor, not a um, ceiling, and still have the, that we do need the conversation. Thank you. 
no, that it's, we could read, okay, yes, we could reduce it further if we wanted to. Um, but I certainly would like to have the conversation. I agree. Thank you. So perhaps if you do need the specificity, having something here that says uh, at a minimum reducing it to, or at a max, at a maximum having the parking suggested here, but with preference to say that we are reducing parking. Yes. Okay. We so could say so the, the preference, the direction is to omit specificity, but we are authorizing you if needed to put a maximum of that amount if required by HCD over the next 60 day review period. Okay. Understood. So it, it would be reducing multifamily parking to a maximum of one space per studio unit and 1.25 spaces per one bedroom unit. If we receive feedback from HCD that they want a specific number. Yes, please. Thank you. Councilmember Nash. Okay. Um, so I, I'm comfortable then making a motion to authorize staff to submit this revised housing element with the modifications outlined by Councilmember Dorr on the specificity issue. Um, I think that covers it. Councilmember Nash has a question. I have one question about, um, we have a goal program policy, um, which is on page 8-23. It's as part of um, program H4A, and it is to consider a jobs housing linkage program. And I wonder if it would be possible if people would agree to call it an office housing linkage program. Yeah, I would just like staff's feedback on that. In terms of the um, applicability of what I would consider a housing linkage fee applicable to commercial development, the broader it is envisioned from the beginning, it could obviously be um, tailored downstream uh, but like your earlier discussions around parking and density, you want to start in a bigger place. Uh, you'd want you want it to apply to offices, retail buildings, hotels, basically in, almost any non-residential commercial, commercial industrial. I think non-residential might be. It could even apply to market rate residential development as well. So it's so you're saying this is a placeholder in a program description that could be modified once it comes back for discussion. I'd have to take a look at the exact language. We do have an existing uh, housing linkage fee, correct? Within Menlo Park, um, there's been periodic uh, with development adjustments to the to the fee itself, but there is so there is an existing fee structure in place. Um, Actually, I want, would like staff to, there's certainly the BMR. What would staff say? So I think we're talking about program H4A item J. That's correct. And essentially um, jobs are good. And so it's trying to pull it into a different um, purview, just sort of calling it I was saying offices, it could be commercial, um, whatever, I guess maybe leave it up to you just looking at that, please. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a little bit different discussion than the linkage fee. My understanding from, from when this was discussed by the council was that um, creation of new gross floor area related to jobs for through commercial development would then require a certain number of housing units to be provided as well, or that link to housing development created from new jobs in offices. And it is mirroring what is being done right now in Mountain View. So, um, all right, thank you. Yeah, the, the policy itself, uh, the, the, the program, um, 
item for evaluation does say creation of new jobs and or additional office commercial gross floor area. Um, so I think it gives the flexibility of council to to make that determination. Very honestly, it was strictly just at the very gross level when we are discussing it to to have it more emphasize uh, to emphasize more on the additional office gross floor area, um, not to eliminate jobs. Um, whatever staff decides is fine. Thank you. Do you need actual decision on that since you're looking, is that sufficient? Yeah, I think we can evaluate that and um, we'll discuss, I think as a project team and then I believe it's semantic and the issue is not to do any, spend much time on it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, I believe I made a motion. <laughs> I am looking for a second. I will second. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Dorr to authorize staff to submit the revised 2023 to 2031 six cycle housing element to the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Any further City Council questions or discussions? Seeing none by Ma rule. Mayor, I apologize, Mayor Wilson, just to confirm that your motion included the direction to staff to modify the program as enunciated by Council Member Dower. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me include that. Direction. I did. Okay. Thank you, uh, City Attorney, for including that in the motion. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Dower? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Combs absent, as well as Vice Mayor Taylor absent. Thank you. And thank you to, again, our city staff um, who've been working tirelessly and our consultant team on this housing element. Um, and our fingers are crossed that the 60 day review period with HCD goes well. And for members of the public and for those who report information to the members of the public, please communicate and know that um, this summer soon we will be having some big conversations around zoning particularly downtown. Um, okay, so it is now 8.32. We're moving quite briskly through the agenda. Uh, we're gonna take a short break until 8.40. Um, so we will reconvene at 8.40. Thank you.
Okay, having our city council back at our in-person dais. Vice uh, Mayor Wilson, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, sorry, we our technology got updated while we were off the dais um, and we're back. So J3, we're moving on to our next regular business item. J3 is to adopt a resolution setting forth civil fines, charges, excuse me, there is a different J3 on the mayor's notes. Okay, just kidding. We are not doing that yet. We are now going on to what is actually J3, which is waive the first reading and introduced by title only an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment, also known as ZELE. And to introduce this item is our sustainability manager, Rebecca Lucky. Good evening, Ms. Lucky. Good evening, Mayor Wilson, council members, Rebecca Lucky, sustainability manager for the city. I'm going to go over a pretty quick presentation tonight about the proposed zero emission landscaping equipment rules uh, that we discussed on June 13th, a couple of weeks ago. Let's try to switch to my next slide here. So the staff recommendation is for the city council to waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment. Zelly as proposed, formal adoption would occur on tentatively on July 11th. So just a recap on the June 13th city council meeting this month. So the city council did introduce rules that would regulate five types of gasoline powered guarding equipment. And essentially it boils down to starting July 1st of 2024, gas powered leaf blowers and string trimmers would be prohibited. And then January 1st of 2029, gas powered chainsaws, walk behind lawn mowers and hedge trimmers would be prohibited. The council at that time did direct uh, that outreach begin as soon as possible to enable a, enough time for the community and professional gardeners to transition to electric leaf blowers and string trimmers, and also directed staff to move forward with a Menlo Park electric gardening equipment rebate program with some um, additional criteria for residents regarding hardship and uh, hardship criteria to evaluate in providing the rebate to residents. And that'll come before city council at uh, tentatively again on July 11th as a separate agenda item. So the next step was to consider formal adoption tonight. Uh, however, their staff did identify that a potential confusion point with the ordinance that was proposed on June 13th, where it had, um, operational hours that were both in the Zelly proposed Zelly ordinance and also in the noise ordinance. So to try to alleviate any kind of confusion, uh, we removed the uh, hours of operation from the Zelly ordinance and then referred back to the noise ordinance for hours of operation of elect um, electrically powered equipment. Because of this change, it does require the city council to reintroduce the ordinance. So a second reading would now occur on July 11th if the council introduces the ordinance tonight. And that concludes my presentation. I do wanna mention at the last council meeting, <clears throat> Vice Taylor and Mayor had um, commented on kind of reaching out to larger landscaping companies such as Gachina, and they did uh, reach out to the company and they expressed concerns over battery life and how to use the batteries and in, in hot temperatures. And so kind of goes back to what um, we've been hearing also from smaller gardeners that the battery life, because you know, they're working outdoors, um, sometimes in heated conditions in most cases, that it does end up reducing the, the battery life. So whereas a battery would normally last for several years, 
it then can uh, only last two years because of kind of the presentation for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Ms. Lucky. I, I believe you froze towards the end of your comments. Oh, sorry. You're talking about the battery life and the heat, and it sounded like because of the hotter conditions, some of the batteries don't last as long as advertised. Is that what you were speaking of? And I think you're frozen again. So... Oh, wait, just a moment. I'm as okay. lucky. Yeah, you froze yes. again. Um, I don't know if you heard what I said. Was that correct? Can you repeat it one more time? I apologize. That, that the heat makes the batteries not last as long. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. And thank you for that presentation. So to clarify, this is a kind of a technical um, cleanup. Um, that's why we're, it's coming back to us tonight for an, another first reading. Um, and then with the additional information that you provided of the landscaper that you contacted. So thank you. Um, so Ms. Heron, then at this time, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes. Thank you, uh, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our regular business item J3, waive the first reading and introduced by title only in ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment known as Zelly. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And our speaker will be Jackie. Jackie, you should be able to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Good evening, Council. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to speak. Um, I own Katina Landscape Management, which is located in Menlo Park. We are a 35-year-old company, uh, about 25 years in Menlo Park. I um, have certification for women and minority owned. We are about 400 people. Um, and I want to sort of give a different perspective than what um, Armando Vega from EnviroViews did. Um, I believe he was speaking more towards smaller companies. Um, and so don't get me wrong, and I represent larger uh, landscape companies in the green industry. We support a transition to um, EV equipment. We think it is the right thing to do. We believe that it's better for the planet and better for everybody. However, we would like it to happen when the technology can support the goals that the cities and CARB are um, proposing. So I sit on um, committees for NALP, the National Landscape Association, the CLCA, the California Landscape Association, and also sat in on the CARB meetings. Um, when Rebecca talked about uh, life expectancy, we had steel, which is a commercial um, EV equipment manufacturer come and visit our offices to tell us how we could get the most out of batteries. And the significant part that came out of that is that batteries to be optimum need to function between 58 and 68 degrees. If we can't do that in transportation, in using them, in storing them, we don't have optimum um, life of the batteries. So we are talking about two and a half to three years maximum right now. Normally on gas equipment, we get seven to 10 years. So we will be dumping equipment, every, and I'm doing it right now, every two and a half to three years, which I don't think is a sustainable practice. Um, and then we also have gas equipment that we won't be able to use now. Again, we're adding to landfill because we're not maximizing the use, usable lifespan of that equipment. So, um, what I would like the city to consider, consider is that because the rebates really are geared towards smaller companies, 
that the smaller companies don't need the heavy um, equipment and batteries that we use, that possibly this could be phased in with companies that are less than 100 people, less than $10 million, that do more residential work that the current EV technology will support. Um, the backpacks that we use are between 26 and 38 pounds. They're $2,500 a piece with one battery. We're getting two and a half to three years life out of it, and we cannot maintain it at the 58 to 68 degree temperature that's required. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on regular business item J3. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willis and you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron, and uh, thank you to Jackie for your public comment. Um, Ms. Lucky, um, I have uh, a follow-up question for you. Um, do you know, um, there are other cities nearby who currently do not allow gas leaf blowers. Is that correct? Like Palo Alto, um, I can't remember the others. Yeah, correct. Palo Alto has restrictions for residential areas. Portola Valley, I believe it's all um, areas, but they're mostly residential. Atherton has just passed one, the city of Oakland. Um, there's many others in Marin County as well. I'd have to go back to the staff report to kind of look mm -hmm. up the others, but there definitely are quite a few in the Bay Area. And, and do you know if the challenges that we just heard, like how they're handled um, in other cities? Because this isn't, we're not the first to do this. Correct. Uh, I, I can't speak to other cities um, and kind of what kind of outreach they've done with gardeners. But as Jackie, the owner of Hachina, did describe, and again, I've heard it from other small gardeners as well, that the batteries um, do need to be replaced like every two to three years. Uh, and that the cost, especially for the backpack leaf blowers, is quite expensive without any kind of incentive or discount. Okay, thank and you. And so, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I guess in closing, I, you know, and again, talk to quite a few folks. I mean, there is the pain point of the transition and kind of working with manufacturers to, you know, produce batteries that last longer or the equipment, um, but that does take obviously time to do. And so there is this interim kind of pain point that um, Jackie is describing that until the industry does catch up and kind of make the equipment in a way that's going to be more long lasting, particularly the batteries, uh, those costs are again going to be a part of the transition for both the professional gardeners and customers as well. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, and um, and confirming that the state of California will no longer be selling um, gas leaf blowers on the shelves starting in January 2024? Cor correct. They will not be selling any kind of gas-powered okay. gardening equipment. So uh, this transition will likely accelerate um, in all communities. Um, and yes. we're, we're initiating ours in July of 24. Um, so um, while, while I am very sympathetic, um, I have to believe that different gardeners work in multiple cities um, and that this is a challenge that's not unique to Menlo Park. Um, so I, I don't know if there's other uh, comments. Yes, Council Member Dorr. Yes, and I, I'm coming back to the rebates. I know that uh, California had, was it $30 million for rebates, um, are any of those rebates available to, to are, are those rebates available to all businesses or especially small businesses? Could you clarify that? Yeah, so after the June 13th council meeting did reach out to CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and they did clarify that the funding is for small businesses. So they set aside about $10 million for micro businesses. So very like 
you know, about 10 employees or less. And then once that money was expended, it would go more to smaller businesses. We, um, I, that is their criteria is 100 employees or less or making less than $15 million in gross revenue um, on over an average of three years. And so the, Calif they, the, the California Air Resources Board staff did also kind of clarify that they have additional funding that they're giving to um, local air districts to disperse and use their discretionary kind of decision making to allocate. And so, for example, in Southern California, those air districts have been providing incentives to um, large landscaping companies. And it did reach out to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District asking if they were going to look at any programs. And they said that they are looking at a program to launch um, over the next year or so for larger landscaping businesses. But again, it's it's still not certain there's been no formal decisions made, but they are exploring that. Thank you. Thank you for the tremendous follow-up that you've done on this topic, Ms. Lucky. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, Councilmember Nash, do you have any comments? So um, I think we are, um, again, this, I think we're all very sympathetic to um, the commenter that we heard um, this is being brought back in this way right now, um, for this technical reason to reconcile the noise ordinance, um, and such. So, um, unless there's any kind of change in thoughts on this, um, I'll be looking for a motion to move this forward. I'd make a motion to move forward with the waiving of the first reading and to introduce by title only, only the ordinance for the zero emission landscaping equipment. I will second. Okay, if you can try using your vote cast system. So we are seeing um, that the motion has been moved and seconded, but we're unclear how to actually, oh, Council Member Nash just did something. Oh, now we can do this. Great, thank you. So we have a motion um, on the floor by uh, City Council Member Doerr. It was a second by Mayor Willison to waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05, gasoline-powered landscape equipment to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment or ZELI by a certain date and repeal Chapter 8.07 leaf blowers and subsection C of Section 8.06.040, exceptions for gas-powered leaf blowers, and by the vote, it was passed with City Council Member Combs and Vice Mayor Taylor absent. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We are now moving on to our final regular business item, which is J4, adopt a resolution setting forth civil fines, charges, and interest rate for unpaid fines from administrative citations pursuant to Menlo Park Municipal Code, Chapter 1.15, Administrative Citations. And to introduce this item is our police chief, Dave Norris. Good evening, Chief Norris. Good evening, council members. And uh, thank you for uh, for bringing me up here for this kind of final piece to our discussion from last week about the administrative citation ordinance. So um, this one's uh, pretty straightforward. What we are recommending is that the council adopt a resolution setting forth the civil fines, charges, and interest rate for unpaid fines from administrative citations issued pursuant to Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 1.15. These fines and charges would not become effective until the date of the administrative citation ordinance, which I think is 30 days from 30 the days date from of today. adoption today. And with, with that, I'm open to any additional questions that you may have, although I will admit I am not the expert on this and I may defer my answer. Thank you, Chief Norris, for that um, fabulous staff report. Um, 
City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comments on our regular business item J4, adopt a resolution setting forth civil fines, charges, and interest rate for unpaid fines for administrative citations, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card and return it to me at the clerk's desk. Okay, and this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item J4. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, so at this time, are there any City Council questions or comments on this item? Um, I'm happy to make a motion, um, ooh, which I'll do on the screen. I. Did it on the screen. Is there a second? Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to adopt a resolution setting forth civil fines, charges and interest rates for unpaid fines for administrative citations issued pursuant to the Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 1.15. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none. And the motion passes with a city council member Combs and vice mayor Taylor absent. Thank you. Thank you, city clerk Heron. Um, if we can hang tight for just a moment, um, there's a question where something we're looking into for just a moment. Uh, yes, Mayor, I think it'd be best if you articulate what your okay, so, uh, request um, is. Yeah. Uh, thank you, City Mayor. I know a lot of intrigue here. So um, going back to, so J4 is done. Um, thank you, Chief Norris. Um, going back to J3, um, uh, Council Member Nash and I were having a, a brief chat um, that we asked staff about um, in response to the public comment um, and um, whether we could direct staff to write a letter to BACMED, which is the Bay Area Quality Management District. Um, piggybacking on what um, Ms. Lucky had said, she had put in a call to BACMED to see if the money that CARB um, gave them could be utilized for some type of rebate for large gardeners that could help a company like the one that we heard about. Um, so may I think there's mayor, interest, yes. Apologies, Mayor Willison for interrupting, but if I may, I think pr procedurally you'll need to reopen um, item J3. So you need to have a motion to reopen item okay. J3. And so I, I will make a motion to reopen J3. Okay. And we're doing that on our screen now. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we cannot do it on the screen. It's not a pre-popular. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I, um, so I'm moving to reopen it. Council Member Nash. I will second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to reopen regular business item J3. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Combs and Vice Mayor Taylor absent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner, um, for making sure we dot all our I's and cross all our T's here legally on how we run our meetings. Um, so as I was stating, there's interest, at least from two of us, um, to uh, have the city send a letter to the Bayer Quality Management District requesting that they set aside some of the money that CARB um, has allocated to them for um, large rebates. And I see Ms. Lucky has joined on screen. Please, Ms. Lucky. Yes, I can accommodate that request uh, and also I think working with the manufacturers and letting them know that there is an issue as well. That was the plan after this meeting if the council approved too. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Lucky. So I'm seeing a nod from council member Dorr and um, council member Nash that we would like to pursue that type of direction. Um, and we appreciate all that work that you've already done and that you will continue to do. Ms. Wagner, was there some follow-up you wanted? Just Mayor Wilson, since you've reopened the item and this is different than what you discussed before, I recommend that you take public comment again. Thank you very much. And actually, unfortunately, it looks like our public commenter has um, potentially left the meeting, but um, City Clerk Karen, can you please reopen public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, we are reopening public comment for regular business item J3. We have the first reading and introduced by title only an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscape equipment or ZELI. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature. If you're calling in, please press star nine if in person, complete a speaker card and return it to the clerk's desk. Okay, final call for the public comment reopening on item J3. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So um, now that we've closed public comment, I believe we've given the direction. Is there anything else staff needs or are our intentions clear? Okay. The intention is clear. Thank okay, you. fabulous. Thank you so much. So we are... Once again, moving on from J3, we've heard J4. So I believe that means we are moving on to our informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the city council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the city council. Informational items are not action items. However, a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on the informational item this evening? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public would like to provide comment on item K1, City Council Agenda Topics, participating virtually, please engage that hand feature bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card and return to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on our informational item K1. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, any comments or questions about the informational item? Okay, we are moving on to L, which is our city manager report. Um, city Manager Murphy, please. Yes, th thank you, Mayor. So I do want to... Um provide a few updates. So one is related to the 4th of July event that you referenced earlier. So this year there will be a um, return of a parade celebration. It's going to be uh, focused on downtown. It will be on, on the 4th of July. Uh, gathering places behind Cheeky Monkey off of uh, Maloney Lane at 1045. And then the parade will proceed down Santa Cruz Avenue and um, end with festivities at uh, Fremont Park. So the overall um, celebration should be from about 1045 to, to 230 for those that are interested. So that's the 4th of July celebration. Um, also like to talk about um, some Caltrain construction. So a few, few weekends, Caltrain did uh, uh, close the Ravenswood crossing for a long, for, for, for a weekend. They completed that work. Most recently this past weekend, they completed work at uh, Oak Grove. And they have the one last crossing, Ensenal, that will be uh, constructed this summer. They don't have the exact date at this point in time, but we appreciate everybody's uh, patience while they make those uh, important improvements in preparation for the electrification of the, the rail line, which should be in effect in 2024. And so the last thing I'd like to um, bring people's attention to is the uh, Middle Avenue Railroad Crossing that... Um, uh, the city has been pursuing for a number of years now. Um, most recently, the city council approved a design in 2020. And in the interceding years, staff and Caltrain staff have been working on the uh, final design for that undercrossing. And based off feedback from Caltrain staff, the city has developed an updated design of that undercrossing with a longer and deeper tunnel to accommodate Caltrain requirements. And so uh, that updated design has been uh, recently posted to the city's website, and we're going to begin the process of uh, 
uh, advertising that in anticipation of a council meeting on July 11th. Uh, it's uh, kind of important to kind of keep this moving along. Very important project and uh, important to make sure people are aware of the progress that's being made and some of the refinements to the design that would affect the uh, Alma side of the, uh, the proposed um, improvements. So more to come on that, but um, an additional uh, updates will be coming for the July 11th city council meeting. So those are the few things I'd like to highlight this evening. Thank you, city manager Murphy. And can you please let us know um, how residents or community members can find that updated um, design for the middle under crossing? Yes, it's on the city's website. So menlopark.gov and the short link is menlopark.gov backslash middle crossing. Thank you very much. So it sounds like July 11th is going to be a busy meeting. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, city council members, are there any updates on your ends? Council member Nash. So we had a Peninsula Clean Energy monthly board meeting last week. And at that meeting, um, our current CEO, Jan Pepper, is retiring. She has been with the Peninsula Clean Energy since its inception in 2016. And Sean Marshall um, was named as the new CEO. And it, good stuff ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Councilmember Dorr? Yes, um, just want to remind folks that there's a really fantastic concert series coming up in our community at Fremont Park, as well as at Carl E. Clark Park. And the next one, um, the first one for the concert series is July 12th, so Wednesday, July 12th, uh, classic soul R&B at Fremont Park at 6 p.m., and I hope to see some of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Dorr, and I want to let um, my colleagues know that Last week or the week before, um, I checked out the new Sam Trans shuttle um, that is running um, uh, pick you up in uh, Bellhaven and take you to East Palo Alto and different areas north of 101. So there's an app folks can download onto their phone if you want to take a ride. Um, and it's pretty spiffy. It's called Sam Trans Ride Plus. And if you search the app, so especially for residents um, who spend a lot of time in the Bellhaven neighborhood, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it's a new resource for the community. Okay. Um, and with that, it is 9:14, and we are adjourning tonight's meeting. Thank you, everyone.